and from representatives of teachers, home builders, and environmental organizations. This hearing was held three weeks ago, chaired by Democratic Congressman Henry Waxman of California. meeting of the subcommittee will come to order. We want to welcome everybody to the hearing today on H.R. 2840, the Lead Contamination Control Act Amendments of 1991. A silent epidemic, lead poisoning, is impairing the mental development of American children. The Federal Center for Disease Control calls it the most common and societally devastating environmental disease of young children. The statistics are overwhelming. Nationwide, three million young children, one out of every six, have blood lead levels high enough to impair mental development. In some cities, half the young children have been exposed to enough lead to cause irreversible brain damage. In one out of every 10 pregnancies, the fetus risks abnormal development due to lead in the mother's blood. Lead is widespread. It's extremely dangerous, and it's a poison. It can be found in our drinking water, on the walls and windows of our homes, and even in our food supply. Indeed, high levels of lead can be found throughout the Capitol itself, even in this very building. Two weeks ago, my staff and the staff of Congressman Jerry Sikorsky, Senator Lautenberg, and the Congressional Research Service tested the water at nearly 100 locations on Capitol Hill including House and Senate office buildings and the Supreme Court. We found disturbingly high levels of lead, in one case over six times EPA's action level. 10% of the samples exceeded the contamination level at which EPA recommends that water fountains at schools should be immediately removed from service. The results of this survey will be released today. They show that no one is safe from lead. Lead is in the home of the Vice President. It is behind the bench in the Supreme Court. It is in the water fountains of the halls of Congress. And it is in the homes, homes of the average American citizen. It is this pervasive nature of lead that explains why three million American children are being poisoned by lead. Sadly, these children drop out of school seven times more often than their peers. They earn less and they have lower IQs. Unfortunately, while the risks to our children are startlingly large, the federal response is shockingly small. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency devotes less than 1% of its budget to childhood lead poisoning. Moreover, the agency has refused to testify today and has even failed to answer written inquiries about its regulation of lead in drinking water. Even worse is a disastrous reversal of policy from the White House. Four months ago, the Centers for Disease Control released a comprehensive strategy plan for the administration to fight, fight lead poisoning. The legislation being considered today is based closely on the recommendations in that plan. Yet the Centers for Disease Control is now being forced to repudiate the key elements of that plan which they drafted. The legislation that we are considering today would rearrange federal priorities by establishing a comprehensive program to end childhood lead poisoning. The legislation is based on a simple guiding principle, prevention. We cannot cure lead poisoning once it occurs, but we can protect our children by preventing them from being poisoned in the first place. That is the overriding intent of H.R. 2840. H.R. 2840 contains new programs to prevent lead exposure from drinking water, lead paint, and food. It also requires testing of lead levels in schools and daycare facilities, and it increases federal spending on lead screening. Taken together, these measures add up to an effective prevention program, a prevention program that this nation 
cannot afford to overlook any longer. I look forward to the testimony today and working on a bipartisan basis with the members of the subcommittee in addressing childhood lead poisoning. We are confronting an urgent problem that we must join together to address in this Congress. Before calling on our witnesses, I want to recognize members of the subcommittee for opening statements and call on uh, Congressman Sikorsky first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, I want to congratulate, commend you, your staff, uh, for doing such an excellent job and leading, leading the way. Lead poisoning was headline news again last night. The levels of lead uh, that would be considered uh, Superfund, uh, Love Canal, Times Beach kind of uh, hazardous waste is present in, the back, present in the backyards of homes in Minneapolis, in the backyards of homes all across America, in soil that children play in and touch and inhale and ingest and lick and take in. Primetime live aired the story on the toxic levels of lead in urban soil that's poisoning America's children. Remnants of lead gasoline exhaust that was spewed for decades along our streets and highways. Thousands or millions of uh, backyard Superfund sites may exist in America today. And you may remember this recent, uh, the recent Newsweek cover story on the threat of peeling lead paint and dust present in the homes in which millions of America's children under seven, those most vulnerable, live. This week we received test results from lead testing conducted by our staff showing dangerous levels of lead in the drinking water in this very building, in my office, and the Chairman's office, and other Congressional office buildings, as well as the Capitol and Supreme Court of the United States. No one is immune to the toxic effects of lead, and all indications are that no one in America is safe from lead pollution. So what's the President of the United States of America doing about alleviating the number one environmental threat to, threat to kids in America? Not much. Not enough. Not anything we could call a new world order priority. Mark Twain often pointed out there's a big difference between lightning and thunder. Thunder makes noise, but lightning gets the work done. The Bush Quail administration obviously doesn't understand the difference. They say, we care about getting lead out of our air. That's the thunder. But when EPA tried to ban the burning of lead batteries last December and supported by every of the six agencies in the federal government, including the Office of Management and Budget and the Consul, President's Council of Economic Advisors, not uh, uh, liberal uh, uh, agencies of any and pro-business uh, usually, they came up, the Vice President Quayle's so-called competitiveness council said no way. The administration says we care about getting the lead out of our drinking water. More thunder again. But the administration's lead action plan zaps the federal lead standard down to zero and puts two more generations of America's kids at risk so big water utilities can have over two decades to try and get the lead out with unknown and unproven technologies. And the administration says we care about getting lead out of the drinking water at our kids' schools and daycare centers. Thunder again. But the EPA's own Inspector General and the Natural Resources Defense Council have both found the administration was wholly failed to enforce the Lead Contamination Control Act of 1988 that we passed with the Reagan administration's support. Sure, the administration has a lead elimination plan for Americans' families. The problem is they limited to one family and one home, the Vice President's. Pretty wimpy lightning. Lead kills, lead retards, and it maims children. It stunts the intellectual development of millions of children in this country. It destroys families, it destroys futures. That's a competitiveness issue, a real one. The Lead Contamination Control Act Amendments of 1991 will serve as notice to every polluter and lead apologist. No more stale strategies or goofy technologies or grand plans. It's time to start to protect our kids with some legislative lightning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Sikorsky. I understand several other members may be joining us soon. Let me ask unanimous consent at this point that all members of the subcommittee will have an opportunity to submit an opening statement that will be included in the record. Our uh, first witness today is Dr. Vernon N. Hauck, Director of the Center for Environmental Health and Injury Control at the Centers for Disease Control. 
Dr. Hauck, uh, we want to welcome you to the subcommittee meeting this morning. Your prepared statement will be made in the record uh, in its entirety. We'd like to ask if you would to try to uh, keep the or oral presentation to around five minutes. There's a button on the base of the mic. Please push it forward. And uh, here we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'm Vernon Hauck from the Centers for Disease Control. I'm again pleased to testify on behalf of the department on the subject of lead poisoning. The department strongly supports efforts to prevent lead poisoning, which remains the most common and societally devastating environmental disease in young children. Studies on the health effects of lead over the past decade uncover a consistent trend. The more that is learned about lead's effects on the child and the fetus, the lower the blood lead level at which adverse effects can be documented. Because of recent scientific information on adverse effects of low lead level exposure in children, we are developing the new guidelines uh, from CDC. Over the last 20 years, we as a society have made substantial progress in reducing lead exposure in the population. Nevertheless, we estimate 1984 at least 250,000 children in the United States, or 1.5 percent of all children under the age of six, had blood lead levels above 25 micrograms per deciliter, and three to four million children, or 17 percent of all children under age six, had blood lead levels above 15. The large number of children with blood lead levels of the toxic range show that existing environmental lead levels in the United States provide no margin of safety for the protection of children. Childhood lead poisoning is entirely preventable. We continue to believe that a concerted society-wide effort could eliminate this disease in the U.S. in the next 20 years as a public health problem. As you know, in February, the Secretary released the strategic plan and detailed the first five years of this effort. The first element of the plan increased is increased childhood lead poisoning prevention activities. This includes screening children for lead poisoning, ensuring appropriate medical and environmental follow-up for poisoned children, and education and outreach about childhood lead poisoning and its prevention. These secondary prevention activities will continue to be essential, while over time we work toward achieving primary prevention of this disease. The department strongly supports the reauthorization of the lead poisoning program, as included in Section 2 of 2840. As I have testified many times, cost-effective and safe lead abatement, lead-based paint abatement is essential for the elimination of lead poisoning. This is the second critical element in the strategic plan. Lead-based paint is the most con concentrated source of lead to children, and historically is the source most closely linked to overt lead poisoning in children. H.R. 2840 addresses effective and safe lead-based paint abatement by calling for training and licensing of lead inspectors and D-letters and certification of laboratory measuring the lead content of environmental samples. These topics were discussed in the chapter on infrastructure development in the strategic plan. It is not apparent that federal government certification and, li and licensing is necessary, however, at this time. H.R. 2840 also calls for regulations to require the testing for lead-based paint and disclosure of these results at certain transactional events involving residential property. Although real estate testing and disclosure is, is discussed in the strategic plan, the administration sees no reason for the federal government to legislate or regulate these informational transactions. The third critical element of the plan focuses on other widespread sources and pathways of lead exposure to children. In the past, we have all thought about each source of lead individually. We fail to consider that once lead gets into the child, it doesn't matter what the source is. All sources add up and contribute to the overall levels of lead in the, in the population. It is important to recognize that high-dose exposure may result from other sources, such as food, punch, etc. We have a landmark opportunity to make a major impact on the lives of the children of this country. This is one of the few times where we have enough knowledge and ability to eliminate one of the major diseases of the children. No entity can do this, can solve this problem alone. However, through a continued coordination at the federal level and work with state and local governments, the private sector and individual citizens, we can have an impact on the future of millions of our children and indeed the future of our society. Our children, the most important resource for the future, deserve nothing less. And we at HHS are committed to doing our part. 
While the administration endorses the goal of reducing lead exposure, the administration cannot support the bill itself. We, along with EPA, OSHA, and HUD, are moving together to reduce unacceptable levels of lead exposure in this environment using existing authorities. This concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hauck. Uh, I appreciate your appearing before the subcommittee to testify on lead poisoning. You've, you've testified in the past on this subject and given us very startling testimony about the pervasiveness of lead poisoning. Now, oftentimes we hear about people being exposed to carcinogens from a number of different sources, and we try to develop strategies to minimize the impact of carcinogens. But carcinogens really uh, have an impact maybe 10 or 15 years down the road in a cumulative way, and in some people will cause cancer. With lead exposure, we're talking about almost a certainty for the children impacted of mental impairment. Isn't that the case? I believe so, yes. So we're talking about actual poisoning, not just a potential impact of, uh, of, of, uh, 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 against uh, the health of the people involved. The, um, you've been a very forceful advocate of increased attention to childhood lead poisoning. You've called childhood lead poisoning the most common and societally devastating disease of young children. You put together an outs outs outstanding strategic plan to combat lead poisoning, and I have a copy here. Uh, this is the report that you put out. It's only four months old because it's dated February 1991. I don't doubt your personal convictions about the importance of doing something about lead poisoning, but it's been apparent to me that the administration has sent you down here to testify and to make a, a, a U-turn on childhood lead poisoning. When Congressman Sikorsky and I put together H.R. 2840, we paid very close attention to this uh, strategy, which the Centers for Disease Control submitted four months ago, and we uh, modeled our legislation on the recommendations in this report. But today you've been sent by the administration to disavow the positions that you took in this very report. What I want to do is go through some of those recommendations in this strategic plan and compare them first to H.R. 2840, which is our bill, and then to see where the administration stands on these positions now. Let's begin with the program to license lead inspectors and abatement workers. This is an important program. The Alliance to End Childhood Lead Poisoning calls it the single most immediate obstacle to progress. We need to license inspectors and workers so that families with lead problems in their homes can turn to qualified people to eliminate the risks. In Los Angeles, where, where I uh, represent and where I come from, it's impossible to find qualified D letters. In fact, one family told us they had to fly a contractor out from Massachusetts to remove old lead paint from their home. Well, in your strategic report in February, you recognize the importance of licensing. On page 30, you wrote, and I quote, mandatory requirements for the certification of contractors and their workers, testers, and inspectors should be established. We took that recommendation to heart. It, it, in the bill, uh, we have a, a provision for inspectors and abatement workers. Yet, as I understand the, the written testimony you've submitted to us, the administration now opposes licensing. Your testimony today is, I quote, it is not apparent that federal government certification and licensing is necessary. How do you justify this 180 degree uh, change in position? The strategic plan, Mr. Waxman, was put together by a whole group of, a group of people, and as we testified before, we included the elements that we thought were necessary uh, to accomplish the goal of preventing childhood lead poisoning. We specifically stated throughout the plan, and I believe at the last time I testified before your subcommittee, that these were not all the roles for the federal government. There were state roles, there were private sector roles, and all these are not spelled out explicitly in the, in the plan as we develop an implementation plan they would be. Uh, my prepared text and what I read today 
uh, said that the administration did not believe that there was a, a necessity for the federal government uh, in the licensure uh, of, of these activities. Well, let's look at this question. You, uh, your plan said it's important to have people who are competent to do the uh, inspection and, and work on uh, taking lead out of homes. We need a competent, qualified people. Usually when we want qualified, competent people to do something, we set some standards for what that competency might be. Uh, that can be done at the state level. It can be done at the federal level. The bill provides that it will be done at the federal level unless the states adopt their own legislation and then the state law would prevail. What's wrong with that? The, it is essential that we have people who are competent to safely remove lead paint, both for the protection of themselves and their families and the people living in the house. Uh, where, who regulates that competency uh, is, I think, the, the matter of, of some questions. I noted uh, in, in uh, your bill that there was also a provisions that the states uh, could apply to do this. It is my personal view from being around this field uh, for 10 years that the closer that is to where the action is going on, the more effective uh, it would be. Well, I agree with that position. But and if the states don't act, don't we have a responsibility when we recognize this terrible threat to children's health to make sure that it's being done and to push the states to do it? Don't we have a responsibility to take this strategy plan that you've recommended to us and make sure that it's followed and not just hope somebody else does the job? Uh, someone does, uh, sir, and I would, would hope also that the parents and the citizens in the community would have a responsibility to ensure that this is done appropriately in, in their community. Well, I fear it won't get done if we don't insist upon it. Let's look at another provision. H.R. 2840 contains a requirement that HHS set standards for products used in lead abatements. And now the administration is opposing this requirement. Uh, why, why, are you, why is the administration now opposing uh, this requirement when the strategic plan, which you developed, said uh, that during the past few years, private firms have developed a variety of new products to reduce the cost of lead-based ba paint abatement standards and performance criteria must be established to assume the effectiveness of the new products. That's what the report says. Now the administration is saying we shouldn't have that in law. Why not? I, I believe that it is important to have products that can do this safely and cost effectively, uh, whose responsibility it is to develop those uh, and the strategic plan uh, has not been, uh, been set. Well, if, it, if it's not our responsibility at the federal government, it sounds like we're just hoping somebody else will do the job. And I'm afraid that nobody's going to do the job, and nobody has done the job up to now, and that we're going to have continued poisoning of our children. Let's turn now uh, to the standards of, for laboratories that test lead paint samples. In the strategic plan, you state, again I quote, within the next 18 to 24 months, some laboratory accreditation program is clearly needed to assure that consistent and reliable laboratory results are obtained. That's what you said in the strategic plan. Uh, we, we took that provision and put it in our bill. We required HHS to develop a program to certify laboratories within 24 months, the outer limit recommended by the strategic plan. Yet now the administration is opposing this provision. How do you justify that? We have a program which I mentioned to you before my last testimony that over 400 labs can now measure lead in blood uh, accurately uh, and down to, to the levels that we're talking about. Uh, we do not have a program for, for the environmental measurements at this point that, that I'm aware of. Uh, I believe these are essential uh, if we're going to accomplish our goal of reducing childhood lead or limiting childhood lead poisoning. Again, it's the issue of, of who does it. If one looks at the regulations that were associated with the Lead Poisoning Prevention Act that began in 1972, that any community 
that received grant funds from us, these were part of the requirements that that community had to develop uh, abatement strategies, abatement. There was no licensing requirement, but safe and effective abatement and laboratory standards uh, for doing this. Well, Dr. Hawk, it's very plain to me what's going on here. Uh, the administration released the strategic plan with a great deal of fanfare in February. It had good press for trying to do something they claimed about the most serious problem facing children, but it's clear they have absolutely no intention of ever executing this plan. Somebody else may follow these guidelines. Some other agency of government may do something. Maybe the private sector will get it done. Maybe, maybe it won't get done. And maybe we'll be sitting here another year from now and a year after that talking about how the education president with all of his initiatives couldn't educate children whose minds were impaired by lead poisoning and never even had a fair chance in the beginning of life uh, to advance and to improve and to achieve what otherwise that individual might have achieved had we prevented uh, this poisoning and this impairment. I, I, regret, uh, I regret the administration's turned its back on its owner's Centers for Disease Control and refused to, uh, to move forward with legislation to accomplish something that must be accomplished and no one uh, should be able to disagree with. Uh, Mr. Hester. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly appreciate uh, the ability to be here today and uh, ask some questions. And I also appreciate us taking this our typical nonpartisan approach to this problem. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, have been concerned when I read in the newspaper about lead in Capitol Hill here. I thought that maybe some of the people who've been here around a long time been drinking that water. Thought a little funny, but I didn't, now I know why. <clears throat> but uh, Dr. Hauk. Uh, you think that, uh, well, let me ask you, do you, do you see that uh, this problem, uh, who, who removes this lead? The lead is removed uh, generally by contractors. Basically um, in the private sector, in, right? In the private sector. And is there any regulation, or do states put on any regulation of what the, the standards that these people have to meet? M most states have no regulations and uh, that I know of, and with the exception of the state of Massachusetts, I believe that's true. There may be some local uh, city regulations that are left over from the old lead prevention program that was was funded from in the 70s. Is the material that's removed from these uh, domiciles and apartment buildings uh, classed as a hazardous material? Uh, not generally, and I testified uh, uh, several times before that that not only is a safe and effective abatement, but the safe and effective disposal of the debris that is removed is also essential. Is that a problem today as you see it? Uh, I believe it is, sir. Do you, um, um, what kind of products? Is it, you just scrape the stuff from the wall? Or, uh, you know, I, when I was involved in the state of Illinois, uh, when we had asbestos abatement, and, you know, there were a lot of procedures set and standards set and licensing put in place and ways of disposing that material. Do you, um, think that, uh, well, let me ask you another just simple question. Uh, how do you remove this stuff? Do you scrape it? Do you dissolve it? What happens? Some of the lead paint on the inside and the outside of the homes in this country contain as much as 50 percent lead, and some of it a little bit more. 50 percent? 50 percent. It's a lot of lead. It's very, I think, high-grade ore is about uh, 3 or 4 percent. That's the um, the lead is removed either with a heat gun, which is not very safe, uh, scraping, burn it off. heating it down, scraping it off, uh, uh, sanding it, which is not very safe, uh, removing uh, the, some of the boards and disposing of the doors, the doors, the windows, that whole thing, uh, putting covers, a, a barrier, covering it up with some other uh, wall uh, material. Um, the the hazard of lead is is from so let me get this you can scrape it off you can burn it off you can sand it off you can encapsulate it and other than encapsulation none of those are very safe and, and need very careful worker protection and protection for the families and the homes 
Any idea the cost of lead abatement? I believe the average cost that, that HUD, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development is using now is somewhere be, between eight and ten thousand dollars per residence. There are abatement. There are some abatement techniques that are significantly less than that, and it depends upon how much and where the lead is in the house. Uh, certain cities in the country, the tradition has been only to paint the door stops and the sills and lose a lot, a lot of wallpaper. Uh, other cities that is not used and lead is more pervasive. So in your opinion, then we need to uh, make sure that there's some system in place that the processes of lead removal are somewhat standardized and, and safe, is that correct? Yes. And, and, more and that the disposal of the remnants of the product or the remnants of the removal then are safe and acceptable. Yes. And do uh, you think that uh, states, uh, in your opinion, states, localities, uh, who should be responsible for that? It, it is my, my view that they are more effective uh, the closer they are to where the action is, than the local level, the state level. Um, but whoever is responsible for them, they need to be done. Mr. Howe, uh, H.R. 2840 would give the Department of Health and Human Services uh, almost exclusive authority to set up a program for lead, ab <coughs> for lead paint abatement. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony that the work of the Federal Lead Task Force, which includes EPA, HUD, and other organizations, uh, which approach do you think is more likely to be effective? The provisions in, in Section 3, I believe it is, of the Act are not what normally HHS uh, usually does. Uh, I think it's going to have to be a cooperative effort uh, through all sectors, all parts of the federal government, the private sector, the states, and the local governments. Uh, not, uh, the problem of, of lead poisoning in children and the problem of abatement uh, is big enough that there's enough work for all of us to do for many years. Dr. Hook, how would, you, how would uh, HHS enforce the lead inspection requirement in H.R. 2840? I do not know yet. Uh, would the rules and regs be passed on to the states to, to enforce? If, if the legislation were passed and signed into law and this became our responsibility, uh, we would get a group of people, including the Office of the General Counsel and everybody else, and discuss this and what would be the best way uh, to implement uh, uh, these. So then we would have. Uh, the federal government enforcing upon the state's mandates and procedures to do this. Uh, is there funding in this bill to do that or uh, with authorization for funding I, to do that? I don't know, sir. I did not. In my copy of it, I did not see it. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hastert. Mr. Sikorsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Hauck, uh, I want to discuss the inspection and disclosure requirements of H.R. 2840 with you. As you know, the bill requires that homes be inspected for dangerous levels of lead paint before sale or rental, then requires the results be disclosed to before a new family moves in, a renter or buyer. The program ensures that families know the dangers of lead poisoning, thereby giving them a chance to defend themselves uh, and their children. The idea is like a termite inspection except much more important since the health of children is at stake and the threat here is, is uh, invisible, odorless, tasteless, and the target of this threat is the um, minds and bodies of our kids. The strategic plan endorsed uh, that you uh, that came up with uh, endorsed the idea of inspection and uh, disclosure. On page 27, in fact, it's listed as one of the four main strategies. Uh, however, in the administration testimony that you have to present, you've been directed to oppose inspection and disclosure. Uh, how can this reversal 
on an issue of prime strategic importance be justified? I believe the testimony says it is not apparent that this is a federal uh, role. The, these, this provision or these provisions are included in the strategic plan uh, based upon past uh, experience with the lead poisoning control programs and that generally when parents know of a danger to their children, let me, uh, they let will me do something dissect about that. that. A, a bit. Uh, w you have a uniform on. What's that uniform? Public Health Service. Public Health Service. And, and, and the federal government has a, some kind of a role in public health, right? Yes. And lead is the number one toxic threat to our kids. Yes. Strange. Uh, so they, it's kind of caveat emptor in these buildings, these homes. Some people call them domiciles. Most people call them their homes. Yes. So it's caveat emptor. Uh, as to the likelihood of people voluntarily testing their homes and disclosing it, it doesn't occur now. I know of, of no, or I know, I personally know of no place where, where this is now going on on a voluntary basis. The sellers or the uh, lessers, um, the landlords, in fact, have a pretty intimate economic incentive not to do the test, not to find out. It might make, make that property a little less uh, attractive, right? If, if they found lead-based paint and elected to remove the lead-based paint, it would cost them some dollars to do so. And if they found it and didn't want to put the money into it, that may, it would make it more difficult probably to sell the you know, sunny room, air conditioning, lead poisoning. <coughs> uh, if it were disclosed, disclosed, I would agree with you. The, um, and the buyers, as we understand, and the renters, as we understand today, just, uh, just, just don't know about it. I believe, uh, Mr. Sikorsky, that's true. The estimates of houses in this country with lead just on the inside uh, is about 30 million. And uh, you were at the subcommittee hearing on lead poisoning in April. Uh, the Fandel family from Boston was here. Uh, you probably remember Crystal. She's about five years old and, and yes. she's been poisoned. Her mother testified that she was not aware of the risks uh, of lead poisoning until after Crystal was already diagnosed as lead poisoned and is on intravenous uh, dilation kind of technology that just, that just doesn't, uh, certainly doesn't reverse the, the, uh, any retardation or physical problems that have been caused by the poisoning and sometimes don't do enough to overcome what's commonly occurring on a daily basis in terms of new poisoning. She also told us that uh, if uh, she had known about the, the risks of lead, she absolutely, definitely would not have moved into that, uh, that home and would have saved uh, Crystal. The testing and disclosure requirements in the strategy plan and in 2840 would provide that protection to Crystal and the many other children, millions of other children like her. Uh, but the administration uh, is now opposing them. How do we protect Crystal? Having seen Crystal and many, many other Crystals, one of the reasons the strategic plan has that provision in it is that we think that is essential. That I believe my, I was trying to find it, but I believe my testimony says the administration does not see this is a necessary federal role uh, to require the testing and the disclosure. Apparently it's a necessary federal role for the federal government to get involved and save the vice president's family, but it's not a necessary or important or priority federal role 
on the, as defined by the administration to get in and save the millions of the kids that are affected by it. Apparently, it's a federal role for the competitiveness council to get in and, and uh, protect the few, few uh, lead battery burners in this country so that they can put lead, more lead poisoning in the air our kids breathe, but it's not a federal appropriate federal role for the federal government to say they should do what most lead incinerator, most incinerators do, municipal incinerators do, and separate them out because they're valuable for recycling, but they also don't pollute that way. Uh, families have a right to know whether the homes that they buy, the homes that they rent, are, have uh, uh, toxic conditions for their kids. Uh, given the risks involved, I think it's criminal, absolutely criminal not to in inform them. And some public education program that doesn't involve us, and we say closer to those people where the action is, closer to where the, the people are involved, like someone else, local, city, state, county, uh, pr uh, points of light, uh, in, in NGOs and others, corporations, whomever, can do it, it's crazy because You've been watching this business for uh, probably over a decade now, and lead poisoning. The subcommittee's been watching, and I've been watching it. And only when uh, uh, major things were happening with the first dog and the first lady and the president did, uh, did the vice president get educated on, on this problem. If we can't educate him, uh, how are we going to educate 240 million uh, Maybe it's a bad example, but uh. <laughs> well, try try two de decades, Mr. Sikorsky. But one of the things that we do is we work very closely with your state in developing some of the the, the regulations that Minnesota uh, is now doing. Um, we think in in the cities that have lead poisoning programs, we insist by regulation that some of these things that, that you're talking about take place. The, the, and, and, and you can, and I shouldn't be asking you these questions because you guys came up with the, the, the plans that, em, that are embraced in 2840 and make sense. And, and, uh, and now you have to come and because the OMB, Wizard of Oz, uh, uh, the curtain shaking uh, has, has told you to gag it. Um, uh, you saw last night's program in prime time. Uh, live. It showed the results of investigation lead in soils that they conducted. Uh, urban neighborhoods, including in my home state, which is uh, from that program one of three that's taken action to deal with it, but very little has been cleaned up, abated uh, in, in the process. Lead from vehicle emissions has contaminated the soils or garbage burners or whatever. It's gotten into the soils that kids by necessity play on uh, uh, and get poisoned. The program also reported that testing costs run about 40 bucks uh, 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 and is one of the simple things that can be done to address the problem. If you don't have the problem, you can go, go on to other things that nurture and take care of your kids. Uh, if you do have the problem, then you know the size of it and, and you can cover with plastic and put wood shavings or wood chips on and and uh, plant grass and sod and put sod and the rest of it. Uh, Dr. Hauk, uh, but you can't now in support inspection disclosure, huh? Well, I strongly support inspections and, and disclosures uh, where the responsibility lies to ensure that that is done uh, is, is what I'm, I'm uh, I'm unaware of. How about the soil issue? I mean, we kind of, you saw that program yes, last I, night. I, you think that's a good place to do some yes, inspections I, I, and disclosures, I too? I believe it is very clear that residential soil above a thousand parts uh, per million is distinctly harmful to young children. How much lower than that has to be set and depends on the pattern. There's some areas that 500 is. Thank you, Mr. Sikorsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Houck, uh, the leading areas of exposure to lead are from lead paint and from lead in drinking water. Is that an accurate statement? No, I, I believe the, for high dose exposure, the chief 
for most of the children is lead-based paint, and that comes not only from the, the, the paint itself, but the dusting and the contamination of the soil and the dust around it. Uh, drinking water exposes the vast majority or, or more children uh, than does lead does paint because it's more ubiquitous. Uh, we've been, the Food and Drug Administration and the, the lead and the food industry have essentially, not completely, but essentially removed lead from processed foods. But I didn't understand, you said lead-based paint is the primary area where children are exposed. Right. How about drinking water? And, and drinking water is, is, a, is a source that contributes to almost all children. And okay, so ch those two are probably, while well, there are other ways that children are exposed to lead, those are two major areas of exposure, isn't that and, correct? Yes, and since yeah. the removal of lead from gasoline, right. unless so the we, child done, is around a point source... That we've done a good not, job there. Right. That required federal law, by the way, to remove the lead in, in gasoline, and we've succeeded finally in having done that. I believe we're going to need a federal law to deal with drinking water sources of lead and this lead paint uh, to which our children are exposed. Now, if we're going to deal with lead paint, we've got to have um, people to inspect these homes. We've got to have people removing the paint that has lead in it from these homes in a safe way. We need to have disclosures to people so that they know that they're, they're, the home they're about to buy or the apartment they're about to rent has excessive lead and uh, their children may be exposed to it. Do you agree with that? Yes, it's in the strategic plan, and I do. Okay. In drinking water, uh, Dr. John Rosen, who was the, uh, uh, as I understood it, the uh, head of the CDC advisory committee, said that five parts per billion of lead in water was a level he would consider safe. We had uh, 10 parts per billion in our bill. Do you think 10 parts per billion is a reasonably, is a reasonable, prudent level that ought to be looked at as a maximum contamination level? In, in my view, it certainly should be no lower than that, Mr. Waxman. We have some, some differences with, with EPA at what level um, mm -hmm. drinking water uh, should contain. But at levels of 10, is certainly a safe level. Well, Dr. Hawk, I'm sitting here at this hearing right now awfully thirsty. And we have pitchers of water with little glasses so that we can all take a little refreshing water. But after the survey we did, I know that if I take a sip of water, I'm going to have one out of three chance that I'm going to be exposed to lead in that water that's going to exceed 10 parts uh, per billion. And in fact, the, the survey which we did of just the capital showed that 31, 21% uh, of the taps had levels of uh, at or above 15 parts per billion, 11% had lead levels at or above 20 parts per billion. We had uh, two samples from water fountains that had levels of 80 or 95 parts per billion. In uh, 1989, in a report on lead and drinking water in the schools, EPA said that uh, if there was a, anything exceeding 20 parts per billion, that the uh, water fountain ought to be taken out of service immediately. Now this is the capital of the United States, where we have a one out of three chance of a child coming and visiting here and getting exposed to more lead than getting poisoned from lead from the exposure. What does it do to adults, by the way? <laughs> Probably very little, sir. The adults can tolerate a lot more lead. How about a pregnant than, woman? Than children. How about a pregnant we, woman working in the capital? We'd be very concerned about the fetus with a pregnant woman at those levels. Well, Mr. Sikorsky made the point, and I don't want to belabor it, but we found excessive lead in water in the home of the Vice President of the United States. We see excessive lead levels of lead in the drinking water in the capital of the United States. The, Senate, the Environmental Protection Agency, which, by the way, refused to come and testify today, with a great deal of fanfare again, said they were going to do something about level, levels of lead in water and then established a plan that said maybe 20 years from now we would do something to reduce the levels of lead, but not even setting a cont maximum contamination level of lead. It just seems to me what I'm seeing is an administration that should know that this is a serious enough problem to do something about it, not just in the vice president's home, not just in the capital of the United States, but throughout the country. And if we don't take that responsibility here at the federal level, 
we can just clearly see that no one else is taking that responsibility all across the country. By the way, we didn't just learn about the problem of lead, did we? No, sir. How long have we known that the lead is a, a poisoner of children? The, this has been, been scientifically known of lead-based paint since the late 19, uh, uh, the 1800s and became a concern in this country in the 1940s and then we started to take very specific action in the late 1960s and unfortunately as you're aware each time we've set a limit of what we thought was a safe level of lead based upon the testimony then as we've done more studies we found that that is not safe and we have to go to lower levels. So the problem despite all this time in which we've known that there is a problem is enormous in this country and what I hear the administration saying is rather than adopt laws to implement the strategies that the Centers for Disease Control recommended, that we ought to hope that those problems will be solved at the private uh, sector level. And the best example of why that won't work is that it hasn't worked. And we have uh, still this uh, tremendous problem. My time has uh, expired. I, I do want to recognize Congressman McMillan. He hasn't been here for the first round. I apologize for being late. I, I couldn't um, get here on time unavoidably. So if I'm a little redundant, forgive me, doctor. Um, let me ask you this with respect to um, <clears throat> federal um, action in this area. Has um, Health and Human Services had any experience in training inspectors for uh, this type of activity? We have not. The under the Superfund legislation, the, the National Institute of Environmental Health Science, however, has a training program uh, for hazardous waste or hazardous substance of uh, people working in those areas. Who, who does have the base of experience in terms of, uh, of uh, training inspectors uh, for, for water inspection? Uh, some states, very few states. Very few I, I, states? Yes. <clears throat> but hadn't inspection of water supplies normally been a state or municipal activity? I'm talking about lead-based paint. Yeah, paint, I understand paint, that. Yes. So uh, no one virtually then has uh, a significant experience in inspecting for this, this problem? I think that's uh, providing specific kind <clears throat> of training. I think that's a fair statement. Now, why don't they have that experience? I wish I knew. Well, who knows? Um, I, I think that in doing lead, in doing lead-based paint abatement, which we began, or which began in, in earnest in the 50s when the old lead-based paint poisoning prevention act uh, was in effect, uh, that became a, the removal of paint and the safe removal of paint become, became a critical element of that program, and this was done in the cities uh, set up, setting up their own uh, basic program. <clears throat> the state of Massachusetts has probably the most, uh, the most comprehensive uh, one around. The city of Baltimore has a reasonably comprehensive program uh, uh, for this, but it is fairly spotty. It's not uniform. Do, do these same um, states and municipalities have inspection, adequate inspection systems for other potential threats to the water supply? I, I would have to defer uh, to EPA on that for the, the measurement of the contaminant uh, in the water supply and how uh, effectively that's being done. Well, I, I guess I'm really trying to get at why they haven't focused on lead if they focused on other potential threats. I would, uh, again, have to defer to EPA to, to answer that question. I, I don't, I'm not knowledgeable on that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Gentlemen, you. Yes. It, seem, it seems to me that we don't have people who have expertise in this area of lead inspection because it, we haven't had people trying to find um, anybody to do that job since nobody either insisted that the job be done and the private sector hasn't really f felt it 
uh, as enough of a threat even though they've heard about it in the newspapers. Doesn't that seem to be the reason? There's no infrastructure for inspection and this lead uh, decontamination because no one's ever insisted that there be inspection, disclosure, and lead, deca deca lead decontamination. Which is correct, Mr. Waxman, and, and that's the reason that the chapter on infrastructure and the strategic plan is there that we think it's important. Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm not trying to um, make a case for the private sector. In fact, I don't think they've, my perception of the private sector doesn't have the responsibility for inspecting water supplies. States and municipalities do. Yeah, oh, excuse me, all right. I misunderstood your, your point. <clears throat> um, Dr. Houck, you, uh, you um, stated um, in your testimony that we tend to think about each uh, source of lead individually. Can you tell me anything about the <clears throat> relative exposure from soils and from paint? <clears throat> paint is the, the major high dose exposure for the majority of children. The paint contributes to the exposure both from the peeling and the flaking paint and the child's mouthing intact paint around door sills, etc. And the contribution to soil and lead. Mm -hmm. the, the, the lead in soil and dust comes from lead paint, it comes from gasoline emissions previously that have happened, it comes from point sources, it comes from some pesticides, it comes from a whole host of, of different varieties. Uh, water contributes, uh, the best of our estimate now, uh, between 10 and 20 percent of the body burden for the average child in this country. And this, this is the normal water supply, is yes. what you're suggesting. And would you, would you just uh, expand a little bit on what you mean by body burden? The body burden is the amount of lead a child has absorbed throughout its lifetime and has retained in its body and is generally measured by blood leads, although there are better measurements of this. Presumably the, the same would be true for adults as the, well. Right? Uh, the adults have, uh, the same is, is for adults. The, the average blood lead of a child in this country, in the best of our estimate at the moment, is somewhere around six or seven micrograms per deciliter. And, and that puts in our estimate of three million to four million children above 15 micrograms per deciliter. Everybody, there is no descent, or there is no legitimate descent, that the levels of 15 micrograms per deciliter in children are harmful to children. That's 17 percent of our children. Would the same hold true for adults? No, the adults can tolerate a great deal more lead uh, than can the child. The major mm -hmm. effect of low level that we're concerned about on the child and the fetus is the developing brain and the neurologic system. There is, is very good evidence, which we have uh, stated here many times before, and Dr. Needleman is here and can speak to it himself, is the children with, with quote, high lead, which is really not very high, uh, don't finish high school very often compared to normal children. And uh, because of the neurologic impairment that that's done on the child. And, and the, the consequences of lead, of lead exposure in children, is the moving of the IQ score down. And I believe I testified the last time that nothing could be worse to a society of, of not having any children with geniuses in a population. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Mr. Scorsese, do you wish more time? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Haug, you hit a point. You know, this thing is a long hearing today, and we're gonna, some of us are going to stay here for it. Uh, most people will start drifting out and the rest of it. But it's absolutely essential that people understand that this is a terrible and evil thing. Uh, lead is, it doesn't belong in human bodies, and it affects adults. And it, but it really goes after kids because they're more vulnerable, and the younger the kid, the more vulnerable it is, right? Yes, we are harming children because of something we put into the environment. And, it, and, and, and beyond that, it's, a, it's an evil and, and terrible thing because not only does it go after the body, 
certain organs, the kidneys, even the heart or the rhetoric, but it really goes after the brain, the mind, the human intellect, and it, and it reduces IQs. It not only makes, and Dr. Needleman will talk about this, but not only makes retarded, average kids retarded, retarded kids more retarded, makes near geniuses just yes, above average, and it makes geniuses near geniuses. It moves the IQ level of American society down. And, and, uh, and we don't know what that will do, but we can be assured we won't get the answers to dirty air, lead poisoning, national security, weapon systems, exploration, uh, global warming, you name the problem. Alzheimer's disease, cancer, uh, business uh, uh, initiatives, we're not going to get the answers as readily or as creatively as we would have gotten them as a society. Is that okay? Uh, yes, and there's a lot of things we won't get, uh, Mr. Sikorsky, but there's a lot of things we will get. Mm -hmm. We will get youngsters who <clears throat> no longer have the educational ability to finish high school, who don't have the, the intellectual curiosity to go ahead and do things. We will have youngsters that have greater propensity for delinquent activities, for drug-related activities, you know, for the whole host of things that's associated uh, with what is happening uh, to these kids. We'll get more kids qualified for low-income, low-no-benefit, dead-end jobs. We'll get a lot of kids who qualify to serve in prisons and uh, be drug addicts and, uh, and to cost taxpayers. In my opinion, uh, yes. Why should we wait for someone else to end? So why should we wait? Um, the strategic plan that the department put together doesn't wait. Sets out a course that makes it possible to eliminate childhood lead poisoning, childhood lead problem from this country as a public health problem in the next 20 years. The, uh, and uh, if these kids are really vulnerable, say one to six, that's three and a half generations of kids if we wait for the 21 years and the drinking water and if we wait for the whole, and there are certain things that can be done right now. Um, that's why it just, it just drives me up a wall. It, this is evil and terrible stuff and we're doing it and, and then, we, then the administration, because of the Office of Management and Budget, a bunch of, bunch of economic, econ, bean counters and lawyers who don't understand medicine or public health or let alone care about it, uh, uh, gag people and stop them from moving. I think it's his most corrupt and contemptible act I can think of in government is to see these, this problem and to be told about it by the professionals, the health professionals, and then to stop and to foot, foot drag and sloganeer and, and, uh, and, uh, and eliminate protections that are pretty easy and pretty cheap for our kids. Let me ask you, uh, the HUD's report on lead poisoning defined a lead hazard as peeling paint or high levels of lead dust. Some states, Massachusetts, Maryland included, uh, said that lead paint on chewable surfaces is a has lead hazard as well. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. In fact, it's one of the major sources anybody who has a child looking at the activity of that okay. child while the activity of the child is teething. We'll see him spending hours and hours at door sills and on doors and window sills mouthing that. This is a very important part for the definition of hazard. Thank you, Dr. Hump. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Sikorsky. Mr. Hastert. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I want to go back to the history of this. You gave us kind of a, a, a quick look at the history. Uh, lead paint's been used through the 1800s, uh, became a problem in the 1940s, uh, seriously focused in Dr. Hauck in the 1960s. Uh, is paint, lead paint used today? The Lead Poisoning Prevention Act uh, required that all lead, all paint manufactured after, I believe it's June 17th of 1976 or 78, uh, not contain more than six one hundredths of a percent lead for interior uh, surfaces. Uh, that means that no lead can be essentially added to the paint. 
lead paint is still being manufactured for exterior surface, for uh, industrial surfaces, um, uh, for those purposes, and it is not at all uncommon to have that paint being used on the inside uh, of houses uh, and to paint furniture. Why, well, uh, why do we still, is there a, a, a something in lead that is necessary for these types of uh, coatings? It, lead apparently makes a better product. Uh, more easy to use and they're not substitutes uh, for everything uh, but if it is a better product people ought to be aware not to use leaded paint on children's furniture uh, which although that's prohibited by law still occasionally happens not by the manufacturer but by other people somebody who has a can of paint in their garage and decides to well, let me paint. give you a a specific example just um, uh, I believe about three years ago, the city of Houston bought uh, some paint that had about 10% lead in it and painted all the furniture in the schools. Do you, uh, let me ask you another question about the incidence of lead. In more modern homes, there are less, there's less lead, right? There's been a lot of homes in this country that built since the 1960s or seven, not there's less lead-based paint, but unfortunately the newer homes may have more lead in the water because of the, of the lead solder used in, in the plumbing of the house. Because, and that, why? Because that leaches out? It over? leaches out for about the first five years, yes sir. All right. And it, That's but, prohibited from being used now, but some of it's still being used. Well, I, I happen to remember sitting on uh, the licensing board uh, or committee in the Illinois General Assembly and trying to change uh, the union standards uh, of licensing for lead and the lead use in pipes and uh, of course the uh, Chicago unions coming down and turning around the Democratic majority that uh, ran that committee and we failed to be able to pass better legislation to prohibit that but that was another situation that happens in states right. uh, but can we say that the housing that has uh, lead infiltration in it and, and the paint, is that a certain type of a housing stock? I mean, is it more prevalent in old HUD buildings or uh, old domiciles or row houses or what? G generally, in, in housing built before about 1970, there's a very high prevalence of lead paint in the housing. The, the amount of lead in housing stock uh, or the amount of lead in in public housing varies from city to city depending upon how much lead paint was used uh, uh, in that particular housing. Now the, my uh, fine colleague uh, on the other side of the aisle a few minutes ago uh, talked about the housing that was owned by the federal government and uh, it, when there was discovery of lead there they changed it. The federal government happens to be the landlord for that. Uh, do you think the landlords or those people who own those properties are responsible for removal? Yes. They should be? Yes. And uh, whether it's water or lead paint? Yes. No matter what the cost? That's the economics that they, that they, oh, health issue, they, right? they would have to deal with. Uh, we would not allow an individual, most cities, who have, zo who have ordinances would not allow the rental of a house that contained unsafe electrical wiring that was going to create a fire. So we can have those same type of ordinances and have the people, who, the owners of those domiciles or homes or apartments responsible also. It's my view that this is a very important issue and it also has to be very carefully considered because of the problem of affordable housing, uh, et cetera. It's not simple. But according to do that, just as you would inspect a house for electrical wiring, you'd have to inspect that house for lead, right? I mean, that would really get down to that. We have to have some system in place, whether the cities do it or the counties do it or the state does it, uh, that has to be done. I believe it is essential. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hastert. Uh, Dr. Hawk, we thank you very much for your testimony today. 
we'll look forward to uh, working with you. I'd like to now call forward to testify Dr. Herbert L. Needleman, <laughs> Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Ellen K. Silbergel, Adjunct Senior Toxicologist from the Environmental Defense Fund. Dr. Douglas M. Hansen, President, Water Test Corporation from uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. We're pleased to welcome the three of you to our hearing today. Your prepared statements will be in the record in full. We'd like to ask, however, that you limit the oral presentation to no more than five minutes. Dr. Needleman, why don't we start with you? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I'm Herbert Needleman. I'm Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm also a member of the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Environmental Health and the Institute of Medicine. Uh, I'm pleased to be here to testify in support of House uh, 2840. I congratulate you and Mr. Sikorsky on authoring, recognizing an important problem and dealing with it effectively. When I last testified here in 1979, there was considerable agree disagreement about the uh, impact of lead at low dose on children. That's been effectively settled uh, in the period since that time. And there is a, a broad consensus on the part of everybody except the lead industry and its spokesman that lead is extremely toxic at extremely low doses. Uh, and the safe level of it has yet to be defined. In 1979, the actions of your committee were uh, instrumental in bringing into concordance the science at that time with the federal policy. And as a result, legislation allowed the removal of lead from gasoline and blood leads in this country in children and adults dropped step by step over time. That was a real public health triumph and, and this committee deserves a major part of the credit for that action. That was a federal action that was necessary and effective. <clears throat> Since I uh, testified then, there's been an explosion of, of scientific knowledge in, from human studies and from the animal laboratories about the effects of lead. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the, we now recognize official federal declarations that this is the most serious environmental disease of children. And as you know, the, uh, Dr. James Mason commissioned the CDC to issue a strategic plan, which is a historic document. It needs legs. Uh, I want to make three points. The first is that the more we study lead, the more we find effects at lower and lower doses in, in broader and broader systems in the human body. And we, that process is not over, but we now know that the uh, toxic level of lead in children can be measured at least down to 10 micrograms per deciliter in the child's blood. And that 17% of all American children exceed 15. Uh, being uh, rich does not immunize you against having lead toxicity. 7% of favored whites, according to the Agency for Toxic Substances, su substances have blood leads over 15. Being poor, however, increases the risk radically. Of black children in poverty who enter the first grade, 55% begin their education with this handicapping condition. That is a datum that our society will reject at its peril. The second point I want to make is that this disease is totally preventable, and Dr. Mason and CDC acknowledge that. Uh, and in, the third point is that in doing this, we can accomplish a number of social goods. If you map where lead is piled up in superabundance, and if you map where housing is in, decent housing is in short supply, and if you map where jobs are in short supply, the three maps are virtually identical. So uh, what would a rational, unbound person do with this disequilibrium? Well, you might say, why don't we take the unemployed and train them in safety letting and pay them, and for the same health dollar, we could get a decrease in unemployment, a very dangerous uh, factor in our uh, nation at this point, put more housing back into decent circumstances and wipe the disease out. So that this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, perhaps utopian, but I think it's practical utopianism. The most important cause of lead poisoning is paint. There's no disagreement about it. Water is important, dust is important, soil is, is important. But of the children I see in my clinic every Wednesday with blood leads of 25 or 30 and reports of behavior disorders or speech uh, retardation, the, we uh, generally identify in a high proportion of those children peeling paint that the child has access to. And occasionally I see a kid with a blood lead of 80, and in that circumstance there's no doubt about what the source was. We find that 
peeling paint in that household. Now we've known about lead poisoning since antiquity. We've known about childhood lead poisoning for 100, disease, uh, 100 years, but very little has been done about this disease. And I've pondered this and I've identified at least four factors that are responsible for the fact that we have not dealt with this effectively and, and are perhaps only beginning to, to uh, do something about it. The first is the uh, conventional wisdom is that it has a disease of poor inner city minorities. And uh, uh, related to that is the implicit assertion that if the mother took better care of the child, this child would not have gotten sick. And once that happens, then federal or local responsibility is jettisoned. The second is that with the passage of the Lead Paint Poisoning Prevention Act and the removal of lead from gasoline, some people assume that the disease has disappeared. That, in fact, is not true. Blood leads have come down, but we now recognize toxicity at lower, lower doses. The third place, academic medicine has not been charmed by this disease. It's not liver transplants or gene therapy. And you don't see any advertisements of corporate jets taking children to hospitals for treatment for lead poisoning. And the fourth uh, has been discussed here already this morning, that's the failure of some parts of the federal government to deal effectively with this. I exempt the Public Health Service and CDC from this. When I first began to get into this field about 20 years ago or more, the, there was a nebulous organization called the Bureau of Community Environmental Management, which had responsibility for uh, lead. This was turned over to Dr. Hauck and the CDC, and first, the first time a professional approach was this uh, began to take place and we began to understand and deal with the disease. And the lead industry uh, has attempted to obscure this. So there are four or five reasons that have to be understood if we're going to deal effectively with, uh, with lead poisoning. Uh, I, I want to close by telling you a, a little anecdote. In 1963, the uh, Director General of the World Health Organization was approached with a plan to eradicate smallpox. And he was skeptical about this in the extreme. And he did not want to do it, but his hand was being forced. So he said, well, it's going to fail, so let's appoint an American to head it. And the CDC and Dr. Henderson, Don Donald Henderson, headed that. And uh, on Dr. Mason's wall is a plaque celebrating the 10th anniversary of the last case of smallpox. This is an eminently preventable disease. We can have the same course if we have the same kind of dedication in dealing with lead poisoning. And uh, I think the bill that you propose uh, does give legs to the strategic plan and is a healthy first step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Nadelman. Dr. Silbergo? Thank you. On behalf of the Environmental Defense Fund, I'm pleased to be invited to submit testimony on this important public health issue of reducing childhood lead poisoning in the United States. I'm Ellen Silbergeld, adjunct senior scientist in the Toxics Program at EDF, and I am also a professor of pathology in the toxicology program at the University of Maryland Medical School. I chair the Advisory Council on Lead Poisoning for the State of Maryland, and I'm proud to be a founding board member of the Alliance to End Childhood Lead Poisoning. Accompanying me today is EDF senior attorney, Karen Florini, who has also worked very closely on this topic. The government's position, as you've heard already, seems to be, don't just do something, stand there. It is absolutely incredible, particularly that EPA, with its off-proclaimed focus on prioritizing efforts to reduce real risks, is unable to take effective measures to deal with the single most significant environmental health threat to U.S. children. Lead poisoning, as Dr. Needleman said, is a wholly preventable disease of environmental origin. It is associated with chronic exposure to the element lead. Lead is toxic to all living things and has no known biologic function. It is particularly, although not exclusively, toxic to young children. And I want to stress that the effects of lead on children may also be transmitted through exposure of their parents. Maternal lead exposure can reduce birth weight and affect neurobehavioral development of the young child, but paternal exposure can also affect the neurologic development of the child. Lead poisoning exerts enormous medical, social, and educational costs. These are either paid directly in terms of outlays for screening and treating lead poisoned children and then providing special education for them, or they are paid indirectly in terms of exacerbating the crises of education and social order in our cities. Legislative action is clearly needed to ensure effective prevention of childhood lead poisoning. The strategic plans that you've heard and discussed already are short on actual proposals for intervention and prevention and are largely devoid of funding in any event. 
The agency, EPA particularly, in its recent promulgation of deficient and long overdue regulations on lead in drinking water is a clear example of the unfortunate pattern of inaction. As Dr. Hauck stated, lead in drinking water is a ubiquitous source of lead that contributes to the relatively high average exposures of Americans. For instance, American children on average have double the blood lead level at those estimated to occur in Scandinavian or Japanese children. EPA's craven performance in evading the mandate of the 1986 Safe Drinking Water Act amendments with respect to lead demands corrective action by Congress, and H.R. 2840 does this in important ways, which we support. In addition, the bill provides for a comprehensive and integrated approach to reducing childhood lead poisoning. Lead paint hazards, for example, as noted in the proposed legislation, are the most intense exposure hazard to young children and their families. And the bill recognizes that current approaches are in no way preventive. The trouble is with lead and paint that sooner or later, virtually all homes which contain lead paint will become a source of exposure for young children. At present, in most cities, local regulations and practice allow hazardous homes to be recycled into the housing market as long as the particular poisoned child is removed from the premises. Now, my teacher, Julian Chisholm of Johns Hopkins, has called these killer houses, where child after child is poisoned without action taken to abate the hazard effectively and permanently. This is not prevention. We must recognize that lead paint will continue to be present in at least some American residences for the rest of the lives of most of us present in this room today. And we must create laws and regulations that reflect that knowledge and empower the consumer to act upon it. H.R. 2840 does that, and we support it. However, we also recommend that hammer provisions be included in this legislation in order to ensure a timely integration of warning and consumer protection. We also applaud the inclusion of a mandate for public education in Section 2804, and we suggest that the committee specify a particular role for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry in this process. We applaud the inclusion and extension of protection from lead paint hazards and other hazards to children in schools and daycare centers. We know that children have been poisoned at these places and existing federal programs are non-existent. State oversight is poor. We strongly support the provisions for the training and certification of workers. With growing public concern over lead hazards, there's a parallel growth in the new industry of lead hazard abatement. I would point out Contrary to Dr. Houck's statement that the Department of Health and Human Services has an exemplary record in this area through the training of hazardous waste abatement workers in NIEHS. We also support provisions of this bill in reducing sources of lead in food, in increasing and improving screening efforts by CDC, although we recommend a minimum of $150 million appropriations annually. And there are additional actions which are required to reduce lead poisoning, some of which are outside the scope of 2840. In conclusion, we want to strongly congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, and the rest of Congress involved in the introduction of H.R. 2922, the Lead-Based Paint Hazard Abatement Act of 1991, which will establish a dedicated trust fund for the abatement of priority lead paint hazards in the United States. This is a major undertaking of critical importance and one that will not occur if left to be financed as it is now by the states and the private sector with the merest provision of federal monies. This is a most important and innovative approach to a major environmental problem, and we congratulate you for your role in this as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Silberger. Uh, Dr. Hansen? Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dr. Douglas Hansen. I am president of Water Test Corporation of America in Manchester, New Hampshire. I'm pleased to come before you today to share with you uh, some of our findings about lead levels in drinking water in some of your federal buildings here in Washington, uh, in some of our nation's schools and daycare centers, and also some information about uh, lead levels in our homes across the nation. Water Test is one of the nation's leading drinking water analysis laboratories and has been actively involved in the lead testing uh, programs for over eight years. Since enactment of the Lead Contamination Control Act in 1988, We've been actively involved in performing lead and drinking water analysis for public and private schools across the country. We recently undertook a random sampling of water sources in 12 federal buildings, office buildings here in Washington, D.C., to determine the relative levels of lead in these buildings. 
A total of 170 samples were taken at 85 locations, representing a cross-section of the water locations in each building in question. Two samples were collected at each tap, a first draw sample representing the water that had stood in the pipes overnight, and a flush sample uh, taken after the water had been allowed to run at uh, full rate for a total of two minutes. This is in accordance with EPA's protocol for lead sampling collection. The building sample included the Capitol, the three Senate office buildings, the three House office buildings, including the building in which we are sitting today, the House annexes one and two, two Library of Congress buildings, and the Supreme Court. The results of the study are presented in table one of this document, which you have copies of. 31% uh, of the taps had samples with lead levels at or above 10 parts per billion, the standard which is being proposed today in H.R. 2840. 21% of the taps had samples with lead levels at or above 15 parts per billion, which is the action level established by EPA under the Safe Drinking Water Act for public water supply systems. 11% of the taps had samples with lead levels at or above 20 parts per billion. In 1989, in a report on lead drinking <coughs> water in schools, the EPA recommended that any water fountain or outlet that exceeds 20 parts per billion should be, quote, taken out of service immediately, close quote. The two highest samples were taken from water fountains in House Annex uh, 1, uh, I'm sorry, House Annex 2. These had lead levels of 85 and 95 parts per billion, respectively. It is important to note that analysis of the general water quality parameters in the buildings uh, indicate that the water delivered by the municipal water system to these buildings is, one, relatively hard water, having a hardness in the range of 190 to 240, uh, relatively high pH, in a pH range of 7.8 to 8.2, and of relatively low corrosivity. These facts are important because, in, uh, in general, water with these characteristics would not be o overly corrosive to plumbing and therefore should not cause as much leaching of lead or copper from the plumbing. If the Washington water was more corrosive, the levels of lead in these samples would undoubtedly be much higher. Mr. Chairman, there are two other areas I'd like to, uh, to address briefly. Uh, we have been actively involved in assisting school systems around the country with their lead testing programs. Since 1988, a number of states, uh, such as New York, Michigan, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Florida, uh, have, been, have had active programs attempting to address the issue of lead in school drinking waters. For the most part, these programs have been undertaken in states where there is a well-organized statewide program for health and safety in the schools. Over the past six to 12 months, these programs have slowed greatly the pace of their activities. This, we believe, is largely due to budget constraints in these economic, economic times and the fact that federal funds to assist the states, which were promised under the 1988 Act, did not materialize. Unfortunately, the health risk to our young children from lead exposure does not decrease during economic tough times. In the testing that we have performed since 1988, there have been relatively few daycare centers or preschools unless these were kindergartens which were run as a part of a public school system, i.e. K through 12. No pressure has been brought to bear on private preschool or day, uh, daycare operators to comply with the 1988 Act. In many cases, these individuals may simply not be aware of the requirement. This is particularly tragic since the children attending these uh, schools, the under six year old group, are the uh, children who are most likely to suffer the adverse consequences of low level lead exposure, uh, whether it be from drinking water or from paint. It has been argued by uh, some that lead screening programs of schools is going to be too expensive or that there's simply not enough laboratory capacity out there to handle it. Uh, these things are simply not true. A typical daycare or preschool center with 15 to 30 children would probably require analysis of between one and three samples at a cost of approximately $25 a sample. At a total cost of $75 per school, that works out to be about $2.50 to $5 per child. As a parent of four children, I think that the most parents would find that a relatively small price to pay to ensure the health and safety of their children. There are a number of commercial laboratories around the country 
uh, which are capable of processing and analyzing large numbers of lead samples on a daily basis. This should provide ample capacity to meet the needs of testing programs uh, implemented under the proposed 1991 Act. Finally, I'd like to address <clears throat> one other area of great concern to us, and that's lead levels in private homes which are on private wells. While I realize that EPA's mandate under the Safe Drinking Water Act is to protect municipal public water systems, uh, there are approximately 13 million families who draw their uh, water from private well sources that are not regulated by federal or state programs. These ind individuals are virtually on their own when it comes to questions regarding water quality. There is no agency uh, to which they can turn for help. Since lead is largely an in-house plumbing problem, these individuals are virtually unprotected unless some federal standard is established uh, for lead. Over the past years, we have analyzed tens of thousands of homes on private wells in essentially every state across the country. The lead problem is real. In some cases, it is very serious uh, for these homes on private wells. I would urge Congress and the EPA not to forget these families, and particularly the millions of young children in these families when considering uh, lead exposure issues. Uh, Mr. Hansen, uh, I want to thank you for your testimony and also th thank you for the uh, undertaking the sampling of the water taps in the Capitol. I think you've done us a great service by revealing the risks in our water. And I'm quite frankly alarmed at the results. EPA has said that a water fountain or faucet with lead levels above 20 parts per billion should be removed or replaced immediately. You found nine sites with lead levels over 20 parts per billion. Uh, EPA recommends that other actions, such as flushing the faucets and, and replacing lead plumbing, be taken when lead levels exceed 15 parts per billion. Yet you found 15 sites with lead levels over 15 parts per billion. The results clearly indicate that we have excessive levels of lead in our water. This should be of concern to every person who works here in Capitol Hill. Uh, in one case, the lead levels were found to be 95 parts per billion and another 80 parts per billion, many times over an acceptable level. And this is a concern not only for those people who work on Capitol Hill, but this is not an unusual situation. I noticed that the last uh, edition of U.S. News Re and World Report says, is your water safe? This followed a cover story by Newsweek on the very same subject about lead. Uh, there's a great deal of public concern. Is there a reason for all this public concern? Well, we feel that uh, certainly there is uh, a, a uh, very great concern for lead exposure, particularly, again, to young children. And, and the water, uh, while it may represent uh, only 20 to 30 percent of the body burden, it is something that children are exposed to every day if, if in their homes and now they go to a daycare center or they go to a, uh, to a preschool, uh, they're continuing to be uh, exposed to, uh, to lead in the water. Uh, we also cook our food uh, in that water. We take showers and we're exposed to water in many other ways than simply taking a glass from the tap. Let me so, ask Dr. Silbergeld if I might. Uh, you've heard something of the, of the results for, for here uh, on Capitol Hill. What do you think the significance are uh, from these, of these results and what advice would you give to people working on Capitol Hill? Well, I think they reflect the problems in the nation. And I'm very appreciative that you and this committee are not taking a selective view of only focusing uh, on, for instance, the Vice President's House, but extending your concern to the rest of us. And on behalf of the rest of us, I'm grateful. I'd like to emphasize that these kinds of levels present, first off, an unavoidable exposure. There's no buffer between the concentrations of lead in drinking water and people's exposure because people are drinking that water. And we know that lead that is ingested, either in food or water, presents a very immediate hazard in terms of absorption and delivery. I'd also like to stress that these are real risks to adults as well as children. There is very real and understandable concern about childhood lead poisoning, but we must not forget that lead is also toxic to adults. Certainly we need some very critical research. And in my testimony, I call for consideration by NIH, particularly NIEHS, of the need to fund research 
on neglected areas of lead toxicity, specifically male and female mediated effects on reproduction and development, that is of the father and mother, and also the long-term consequences of lead on aging and potential role in dementia. So that I think these are very real risks for the adults in these buildings as well, sir. Well, the, these tests here on Capitol Hill show us uh, how pervasive lead is. Uh, the congressional buildings are not an exception. They're the rule. So the exposures we find here are likely to be found in millions of homes and offices all around the country. And the risks are likely to be compounded by other exposures, such as lead paint or lead in soils. Dr. Needleman, can you uh, address this overall magnitude of lead poisoning problem? How pervasive is this problem? How greatly should we be concerned? And how urgently should we act? Well, the, the Agency for Toxic Substances issued a historic document a couple of years ago which did some very good epidemiology on the prevalences of uh, lead exposure in American children. And 17 percent of all American children uh, had blood leads over 15 at that time. Uh, for white families with incomes uh, above, well above the poverty level, it was 7 percent. So one out of uh, 14 privileged white children had an elevated blood lead. That's, you can't compare that to any other disease. I mean, uh, we were up, very upset justifiably about measles, but that may be one in 10,000 children in America right now. Uh, for poor families, poor whites, it went from 7% to 25%. And for poor blacks, it was 55%. We're talking about three to four million American children are at risk for uh, 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 brain damage due to lead exposure. And you see this problem of drinking water, lead, as a real one that we need to address as well as the drinking, as well as lead from these other exposures? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hastert? Thanks, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Hansen, I was certainly interested to read your assessment and listen to your testimony this morning about the quality of the water delivered uh, to the Capitol or to Capitol Hill by the District of Columbia Water Utility. Um, you said it's relatively hard water with a high pH, I believe you said, and yes. a low corrosive uh, ability. Uh, that's correct. Yes. And uh, does the, uh, in your opinion, and I don't know if you're an expert on this, but does the uh, city of, Was of Washington, D.C., or the uh, water utility of Washington, D.C., does it uh, put anti-corrosive materials in the water? Does it treat it? I'm not sure. I would assume from the data that we uh, that we obtained from the nine uh, bil uh, the twelve buildings rather that were run, that they do do a corrosive treatment. Uh, that being the case, then these numbers would not improve uh, with any additional corrosive uh, treatment. This is this is how it's going to be. They may you don't know either. I'm they not may sure. Do a better they job. They may it may be possible to do it better. One of the problems with corrosivity. Uh, uh, corrective action uh, is that you can overdo it as well. What you want to do is coat the inside of the pipe so that uh, you are not corroding uh, and not causing leaching, but you don't want too much to be uh, accumulated in the pipe. You can get the other effect as well. Well, this kind of, uh, there's an old term that I guess my old Pennsylvania Dutch grandmother uses, it wonders me. And uh, this wonders me where the lead in our water is coming from. Uh, we checked with the District of Columbia and they told us that uh, there is no significant lead in the source water. Uh, do you cooperate with that? Yes, the, the bulk of the lead in uh, cities that we have looked at across the country comes from the plumbing, either the plumbing in the building, uh, from old uh, lead pipes that are in the distribution system in the, in the streets, or in many cases, uh, it's not the main distribution pipe, but it's the one that connects it to the building. They also told us that there are no lead service lines servicing the Capitol Hill office building area. Uh, so this suggests that, uh, at least to me, that the lead is coming from inside the buildings, uh, either from lead solder in the plumbing or from lead fittings. Or brass or faucets, lead line possibly. water coolers or... Do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, brass faucets are another source. Yeah. Well, here's the most important question, I guess, for the morning. <clears throat> if the lead in our drinking water is coming from inside the building, then what could the EPA rule, or for that matter, Mr. Waxman's rule, uh, do to reduce this threat? Is, uh, uh, well, I, I think maybe the answer might be not much, since neither the Waxman bill nor the EPA rule 
requires building owners to fix their plumbing if it's discovered to be the source of lead contamination. Do you agree? If it's a building problem, then that's right. It is outside of the scope, I guess, of uh, the EPA, yes. And probably most of the problems, and we're, I mean, we really look, need to look at the meat of this thing, most of the problems that we have in this country, even uh, as you mentioned, the 13 million people, such as my family, who is on a private well, uh, the source of the lead is not the well or the source of the water leading into the house or right. to the meter, is that correct? Yes, it would be in the, the plumbing of the house. Yes. On to the, right. to the tap. And uh, of course, except if uh, Vice President's house or HUD housing or those types of things that are owned by landlords or by a federal government, that, that type of thing, uh, most of that has to be done through education. Uh, people taking the time, testing their own water, and then rectifying the problem. Uh, do you agree? Education is obviously a critical component of it. Uh, however, I think you will find we've, our company's had eight years of experience dealing with the homeowners out there. I think without uh, some uh, federal push, if you will, people will not get this information on their own, and, and they are simply unaware of the, the nature of the health threat to them currently. So in conclusion, probably draw from the chairman's survey of water quality on Capitol Hill is that maybe we need to spend a little more time thinking about ways to educate the public about these kinds of risks. And uh, you know, we worry about the EPA's rules for regulating public water utilities. Uh, I brought out in our previous hearing that uh, I think the public water utilities uh, responsibility of from their well to the meter at the house or at the curb is important and they needed it, but that's not where the problem is. The problem is from the meter to the tap and uh, we knew, need a better way uh, just like lead inside homes uh, and paint. Uh, the lead inside waters in pipe uh, need to be addressed by uh, those people who own that property. That's right. It doesn't reduce the health risks to our young children and certainly to the rest of our population. However, so we need to do a little different focus, I would guess. Okay. Gen you. Gentlemen, uh, would yield to me. I could respond. I'd love to yield, but my time's up. Well, you can take with, it. Uh, <laughs> by, with, without objection, gentlemen, be given two additional minutes. I could respond, and maybe Dr. Silbergel could respond to this uh, contention that perhaps uh, the problem is just that the consumer doesn't understand what to do and that people should just uh, recognize that most of the problem is in their home and, and they should uh, take that responsibility. Do you, can, you, can you answer what uh, this bill would do in that regard? I would like to. I think we are approaching a dangerous pattern of blaming victims and exempting government from any role. First and foremost, it's very important to set a clear standard and not to establish the mush that one has to wade through in EPA's regulations under the Safe Drinking Water Act. It is very critical to have a health-based standard, and this bill does that. Number two, we've never believed that notion that the responsibility of utilities ends at the street, sir. With all due respect, if you look at the major strides that have been done in this country in energy conservation, it has been an integrated approach accompanied by rules and regulations from the Consumer Product Safety Commission, among other agencies, encouraging and stipulating energy conservation for home appliances, coupled with amortization programs sponsored by the private sector, which has greatly enhanced energy conservation, for example, in Colorado and in the state Dr. of California. Uh, in other words, before we get off too much on energy conservation. No, it's the same if, model if that a, you've It's the same model. If a water utility. Play my sure. time. Uh, you, you granted me two minutes, didn't you? Which is almost your time. probably. But uh, you know, I understand about energy conservation. I was one of the leaders in the state of Illinois on energy conservation. But we're saying when a problem exists and it's not the municipalities, they deliver a clean product that we need to test. I understand we need to test. I understand the need for standards, and we we have, we need to have the understanding of what uh, the problem is. Uh, so you don't have to lecture me on that. I, I say that we need to put in the ability for people to understand what their risk is in their homes and then the ability to, to solve that problem. But to uh, have the debate going back and forth and saying that, you know, 
you know, the municipality or the water service is responsible for the eternity in this thing or the whole universe on this thing, uh, I think there's a flaw there. I mean, General, people General, have to be responsible. Yeah, well, if you allow me one more minute, I think people have to be responsible. I think that people who own properties have to be responsible, including the federal government. And uh, that's the education of those people and the demand and the whole energy conservation thing that you wanted to get into is because people demand it. It must be done. And that's where we have to get to. And to say that we have to put the burden on a municipal water project or a company to take it from the meter to the tap, uh, you're beyond their ability to do that. No Jeff, if, I, if the gentleman would permit, the point I wanted to make, and perhaps I should have made it very clearly, what we have required in this bill is that the water system have responsibility for testing and sampling of homes to, to identify so the homeowners will know whether their uh, lead level is exceeded out of the pipe. That will give the homeowner the option to do some things. One corrective measure might well be what we're going to do in my office right now, and that's drink out of bottled water, not use the tap water. It may well mean that the homeowner will replace the pipes and take corrective action. But homeowners are not going to take corrective action unless they know what the problem is. And so we want that done. The water systems can also do some things in terms of corrosiveness of the water, which will prevent the lead uh, uh, from, uh, from leaching into the, into the water in the homes. No one is requiring the water systems to protect the homeowner all the way through if the problem is in the home. But what we want to do is get the information to the consumers so corrective action can Mr. be taken. Chairman, I, I, I don't disagree with that. Mr. Chairman, if you'd yield. Sir. Uh, I don't disagree with that. And I think that was probably some of the debate we had before. Who has that responsibility? And I think we ought to test. People ought to know. They ought to be educated. And I think uh, that is something that, that we do have an agreement on. And maybe we're uh, arguing about something that we well, totally I guess I'm, agree on. I guess I'm reacting to your statement that the bill does nothing because it doesn't require anything to be done in the home. And I think the bill does something when the consumers get the information which will allow them to take the action. I think you heard me say that. I think education and perhaps, is number one. And perhaps we do have a, a basis for working together on that. Uh, we always topic. have a basis for working together. <laughs> Certainly. Now that you and I have agreed, we've taken Mr. Sikorsky's time. I'm sorry, Mr. Sikorsky. Well, no, you haven't taken my time yet. The gentleman is now recognized for his uh, question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it is important uh, that, that the gentleman from Illinois' comments uh, about the responsibility of the public water, uh, the water utilities, and the responsibility of the homeowners and the need for public education are not. Uh, assumed to be lodged against 2840. This led, I mean, I agree, and I think Henry agrees with the idea that what the utilities that supply the water are responsible for what they can control and, and not more, except there should be some public education being done as they educate on public water supplies generally. And I think that's agreed to. Secondly, inside the home or once it leaves the public water system, the homeowner, the property owner has that responsibility. That's exactly what's embraced in 2840. If the public utility has uh, uh, corrosive water they have a res and it contributes to a lead problem, they have responsibility to change that. That's what you said. That's what's in 2840. If the public water, or the water utility has has distribution lines that are leaded and they contribute to a health problem at the other end of the line, they have responsibility to take care of that. That's what you said. That's what's here. And public education should be done on on lead and drinking water as well as other threats in in the water supply, and they have a responsibility there under the Safe Drinking Water Act, and that's embraced here under this proposal. Nothing more. Then once it gets in the property owners, that's the property owners' responsibility. That's what's embraced in 2840. So let's get it clear that the the kinds of discussions that went on, for gentlemen from Illinois are not arguments lodged against 2840. Let me uh, ask a question about ABC's primetime uh, 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 show last night uh, on lead in soil. You got a situation where, where there's massive amounts of lead in soil. 
you got lead uh, poison kids and the only source, uh, the, the only major source, the parent source of uh, these kids' uh, toxicity is uh, uh, from lead in the soil. Uh, uh, would you ad address that, Dr. Needleman? I've heard you before and, and I and like to, and apparently the source of this is the gasoline that we used to be We burning. put out many millions of tons of lead in the atmosphere when we had lead and gasoline and, and it resides in the soil. And, in areas where the soil lead levels are 2,000 parts per million, that, that's a hazard if children are playing there. Many of the places where this, these roadside um, superhighways go by are not accessible to children. Lead in the soil is a danger. It is not of the same magnitude as lead in paint. Uh, there are three or four EPA-sponsored studies, a couple of them are of high quality, measuring the actual contribution of soil lead around the residence to the body burden of children. The one in Boston is a first-rate one. I know that stuff. I was served as an advisor to them. And there is a relationship between the amount of lead in soil and the amount of lead in the children residing in those houses. But it's a small contribution. It is dwarfed by the amount of the contribution of lead and paint. Now, in circumstances where a nursery school has been built next to a superhighway or a smelter site, that is a hazard and has well, to be treated Did somewhere. you see the report last night? Yes. They, uh, we're talking about back, front yards, backyards, uh, not next to superhighways. Well, next to superhighways, as I hear you saying, next to superhighways, a few blocks away from superhighways, uh, and not next to smelters, uh, uh, but with concentrations as if they were next to s smelters. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think lead and soil is a hazard. It is not of the same magnitude. I'm so, excuse me for repeating myself. Oh, no, I, under, and, I understand that. And if, and if, if you find the, the point being here is you need a comprehensive approach exactly. to, the, to the problem. You need to test the kids, you need to test water, you need to test paint, paint dust, and you need to test soil, probably in the order of what's likely to be the problem. Once you get the, uh, uh, someone tested, or you get a house tested as it changes hands, you're, you're going to be able to go in the directions that you're more likely. And you say in most cases it'll be leaded paint, it'll be leaded water, and, and leaded soil in that order, I guess. Dr. Silbergeld, uh, any, any comments on this soil? Uh, did you see the, article, uh, the piece last night? Much of the lead in soil also comes from paint, and it's very important not to try and necessarily separate them. As you've stated, and the chairman stated, the hazard is lead. It adds up from all sources and presents as a cumulative chronic problem to children and to adults. We need to avoid fragmenting the problem, and one of the benefits of this proposed legislation is that it takes an integrated approach. One would hope that EPA could have done that themselves, but apparently they need your inspiration and uh, inspiration to work and to even conceptualize the problem in Since its appropriate they need dimension. More than inspiration. F forceful inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just to underscore that point, a couple days ago, my staff was touring uh, the community health center in Minneapolis, and uh, and uh, right in the pediatric uh, waiting room uh, for blood level, lead level testing was an old Halsey Taylor. Uh, uh, water cooler, and they were the ones that sparked uh, the Navy, and then the EPA, and then us, and to get get moving uh, uh, four years ago uh, on the water issue. And uh, and uh, I'll bet you a lot of money that 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 Halsey Taylor cooler, with which stands a great chance of having a lead line tank in it, is uh, isn't been tested. And it underscores the, the need, the pervasive continuing poisoning. Even if you get a kid that's not been poisoned, lead level ch check. They might walk out and take a drink out of a lead line cooler uh, 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 water fountain and go play in a yard and, and, and uh, chew some paint or get a couple granules on their, on their fingers. Another point should be made. You're talking about one or two little granules, like granules of, of sugar. Uh, is enough to, to send blood lead levels uh, real high. Uh, right, Dr. Neumann? Yes. Uh, uh, if a lead paint has 50 percent, and there are 
There are samples like that. That's 50,000 parts per million. No, excuse me, 500,000 parts per million. So it doesn't take a lot of that to poison a kid. Like we're talking little granules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Just, just one last question on that, just to follow up. How much water are we talking about that does harm? If somebody goes out and takes a little sip of a water fountain, is that a problem? No cause for panic, no, indeed. Okay. I mean, if you, if you drink a liter, a quart a day of water that is 15 parts per million, you'll get 15 micrograms. That's not a dose you'd like to have, but one glass of, of water from this building will not poison you, and I've had two today. You've had two today. Mr. Chairman, on that. Yes. When you're talking about a baby in a home with infant formula mixed with leaded water, with uh, apple juice, orange juice concentrate that's mixed with leaded water, with a, a macaroni and cheese and vegetables and other things cooked in leaded water, you're talking about cooking up a, a concentration that gets you pretty close. To, I didn't want your comment to be embraced by parents to mean that they shouldn't take some action. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, the, the use of it in, in formula preparation, the use of hot water in formula preparation has caused Another frank point. brain damage in children. There are cases reported of that. Thank you very thank much. You. I want to thank uh, the three of you for your testimony. I've uh, written a letter to George M. White, architect of the Capitol, enclosing the results of the, the survey that Dr. Hansen submitted to us. And without objection, I'd like to insert in the record a copy of the letter that I've sent to the architect, asking that actions be taken. Thank you so much. I'd like to now call forward the following individuals to testify. Uh, Jane Stern, President, Maryland State uh, Teachers Association on behalf of the National Educational Association and the National Parent Teachers Association. Edward J. Gorman III, Executive Director, United Brotherhood of Carpenters National Health and Safety Fund. Richard Jones, Senior Vice President, Management Services Incorporated on behalf of the National Apartment Association. And Dr. Rudolph E. Jackson, Professor of Pediatrics uh, Morehouse School of Medicine on behalf of the Alliance to End Childhood Lead Poisoning. We want to welcome uh, four of you to our hearing this morning. Your prepared statements are going to be in the record in full. What we'd like to ask uh, of each, from each of you is to limit the oral presentation to no more than five minutes. And we'll have to be pretty strict about that, I'm sorry to say. Ms. Stern, we'll start with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Jane Stern, president of the Maryland State Teachers Association. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this morning on behalf of the National Education Association and the National Parent Teacher Association about the Lead Contamination Control Act amendments. Lead poisoning is the number one environmental hazard facing children today. Almost one-fifth of all children in America have hazardous levels of lead in their blood. Lead poisoning not only threatens the lives and health of young children, but it is also a serious obstacle to the national education goals and our nation's educational and economic aspirations. Lead poisoning is associated with diminished intellectual and physical stature, nerve damage, behavioral problems, and other long-lasting health problems. As a teacher, I know there is nothing we can do which can fully overcome these problems. Because lead exposure is cumulative, and because most of the adverse effects of lead poisoning are irreversible, we must devote our attention to prevention of all types of exposure, from drinking water, soil, paint, and other sources. NEA and PTA strongly support the proposed LCCA amendments. We are pleased that the subcommittee has incorporated many of the recommendations we made earlier this year and I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate some of those recommendations and call for a few additional changes. These proposed amendments would address one of the central deficiencies of the legislation as enacted in 1988, enforcement. 
Up to now, the Environmental Protection Agency has not had adequate authority to require states or schools to comply with the requirements for testing or abatement. Moreover, the required action level was far too high to provide adequate protection to children's health. We appreciate the subcommittee's willingness to include specific requirements that cover both lead in drinking water and lead-based paint hazards and spell out timelines and procedures for testing and reporting to school employees, parents, and the general public. Absent testing requirements, too few schools and states have taken steps to identify where problems exist. Still, we believe that when lead hazards do exist, schools should be required to inform the public in accordance with the EPA guidance document. Informing school officials, parents, and the public is essential. And yet, we maintain that advisories and recommendations are insufficient by themselves to assure that schools, in cooperation with state and municipal officials, take appropriate steps to remedy high levels of lead. Schools, states, and NEA and PTA have extensive experience in dealing with environmental hazards. The record of asbestos illustrates the need for specific action requirements. Long after it was generally recognized that asbestos was a grave health hazard, and even in specific communities where asbestos in the schools was a demonstrated hazard, officials were slow to act. Until schools were required under federal law to develop and implement asbestos management plans, and until schools with the most serious problems and fewest resources to address them were provided resources for that purpose, the majority of schools took little or no abatement actions. We should not repeat the mistakes of the past. This subcommittee has an opportunity to demonstrate leadership in addressing a serious national problem. We urge you to include provisions that require testing, reporting, and action. Further, we urge you to provide funds to assist schools with these activities. NEA and PTA have joined in recommending a number of other technical amendments which are included in the written prepared statement we have provided. I urge you to adopt these recommendations in marking up this essential legislation. This subcommittee has an opportunity to demonstrate leadership in addressing a serious national problem. We urge you to include provisions that require testing, reporting, and action. Further, we urge you to provide funds to assist schools with these activities. NEA and PTA have joined in recommending a number of other technical amendments which are included in the written prepared statement we have provided. I urge you to adopt these recommendations in marking up this essential legislation. We appreciate your efforts on behalf of America's children, and both PTA and NEA pledge to assist in enacting strong legislation to eliminate the threat of lead in America's schools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Stern. Mr. Gorman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your invitation to testify concerning the Lead Contamination Control Act of 1991. I testify today on behalf of the Carpenters National Health and Safety Fund, uh, a joint labor management trust fund representing members of the Carpenters Union, as well as our union contractors signatory to collective bargaining agreements. The fund was established in 1990 to address the numerous health and safety problems of workers and their families and to improve the length, quality, and productivity of workers' lives. Mr. Chairman, we agree wholeheartedly with your observation that lead is the most pervasive and insidious environmental threat to America's children today. We also believe that it is nearly as great a threat to American workers, particularly those in the construction industry. The 600,000 members of the Carpenters face lead-based paint hazards both at home and at work, whether from on-the-job exposures which get carried home on our members' clothing or simply from living in and renovating homes built before 1980. With the introduction of H.R. 2840, this subcommittee is poised to solve an environmental and occupational health threat which has plagued mankind for over two millennia. We believe your, heart, your bill goes to the heart of many of the problems associated with lead-based pain and the medical problems associated with exposure to it. We also believe that this, will, that this bill can become the first truly comprehensive approach eliminating this deadly toxin. For these and other reasons I'll discuss, we commend you, Mr. Chairman, for the commitment you've shown to America's children and workers 
and for the alacrity with which you've moved to craft responsible legislation. The engine that will drive much of the work needed to eliminate leaded paint is the inspection requirement prominently featured in the proposed legislation. Time and time again, we've found that when the public and workers are permitted to know the hazards they face, they will react in responsible and prudent ways to eliminate them if given the wherewithal. As this subcommittee is well aware, the inspection mechanism guarantees the public and workers the right to know the extent and severity of preventable lead-related injuries to their health. With that knowledge, an owner or lesser assumes a duty of due care, a duty which, if breached, causes liability under common law. In the case of this legislation, within two years after enactment, sellers and lessers of residential premises must arrange for licensed lead inspectors to conduct a lead inspection of the premises and provide a lead hazard inspection report to purchasers or lessees. The two-year grace period before the effective date of this provision is certainly adequate time for all parties to be put on notice of its requirements. Moreover, as you are aware, the inspection requirement itself has been utilized to great success in the state of Massachusetts. Similarly, the requirements of strong lead abatement standards will, with minimal refinement, protect the occupants of residences and the workers involved in deleading. In, in our view, the bill also is responsible and quite cautious in providing for a report by the implement, implementing agency on lead inspection and abatement methods and devices within the first year after enactment of this title. The clear intention of this language is above reproach. The agency must learn, among others, what the most health protective, cost effective, and building modernizing abatement practices are before setting the necessary standards governing owners and contractors in the private sector. This is an approach Congress failed to fully utilize when asbestos abatement was being considered to the great detriment of the control industry that developed uh, after the enactment of Asbestos Hazards Emergency Response Act of 1986, otherwise known as a HERA. Licensing and certification of inspectors, de-letters, and laboratories are another strong feature of the bill. We believe that federal regulators must accredit training providers to train and certify both lead inspectors and de-letters in compliance with the lead abatement standards established by this legislation. The model established by AHERA and subsequent regulations have proven the accreditation certification approach to be a worthy precedent in establishing strong health protections for the public and for workers. In addition, the provisions establishing a strong education program upon en enactment serve well the public's need, public's need to know and lays the necessary groundwork for later inspection and abatements where applicable. Uh, to, to touch upon a comment made uh, by uh, Dr. Hauck earlier and which you pointed out, uh, again, I think that uh, there's simply no excuse for not licensing workers and de-letters um, and inspectors. Uh, unlicensed workers put the public at great risk uh, of harm from fly-by-night contractors. State-by-state uh, -state development of, uh, of these standards shirks the federal duty to protect the health of all Americans. Uh, caveat emptor simply cannot be the rule that prevails here if uh, innocent children are to be the victims. Um, the administration says it'll get done. They say it'll get done voluntarily, and I can tell you of at least one example where it has not been done, and that is the exposure of construction workers to lead, lead uh, hazards. Uh, we have known for 20 years now that the standard that the only standard that applies to construction workers is well out of date and that general industry uh, um, uh, has had a lower standard for some time. We need to move on these things. We need to move quickly and we commend you and this subcommittee for the actions you, you, we hope you'll take. Thank you very much, Mr. Gorman. Mr. Jones. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Richard Jones, Senior Vice President of Management Services Corporation, based in Charlottesville, Virginia, operating over 2,400 units. Today I'm testifying on behalf of the National Apartment Association. Accompanying me is Theodore Adams Esquire of Christian Barton Epps Brent and Chapel, based in Richmond, Virginia. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee to discuss H.R. 2840 and the problems associated with lead-based paint on multiple family, multifamily housing properties. NAA members have struggled to reduce exposures and yet not impact housing affordability. Renters already spend a disproportionate share of their income for housing. NAA believes that everyone has a right to a safe and healthy environment. However, the threat of lead exposures it continues to be problematic for the management of safe, healthy, and affordable housing and water supply throughout the country. 
Even with all the years of research and legislation, NAA is concerned about the patchwork effect that these initiatives have taken. The problems of lead in the environment are ones that need to be solved by teamwork and coordination. Building owners and managers are facing exorbitant costs to abate LBP without assurance that intact paint is the major and sole contaminant. HUD and the C Center for Disease Control have indicated that perhaps the majority of lead poisonings in children stem not from intact LBP, but from lead contaminated dust, which is not necessarily from intact paint. HUD reports that, and I quote, the multiplicity of sources of lead in the environment makes it difficult to measure the exact contribution of LBP to lead poisoning, end quote. Many states are taking the lead problem in children as a priority public health issue. At a federal level, level, NAA would like to see legislative and regulatory initiatives that comprehensively address a number of concerns which are listed in our written statement. However, we believe that the bill falls short of a comprehensive approach and does little to reduce the amount of lead in the environment. Our, or, our oral comments focus on the training and inspection standards and the disclosure provisions. NAA supports initiatives to improve the qualifications of LBP abatement workers. A major dilemma for building owners and managers is the availability of a qualified workforce. Poorly trained workers increase the danger to the public by improper work procedures. NAA does not support Section 2802 because it will not serve the purpose for a comprehensive federal policy. Instead, we believe it will lead to an overreaction of the marketplace, create unnecessary exposures, and decrease opportunities for affordable housing. The timetable contradicts the intent of the legislation. The bill requires establishment of accredited training programs for workers after a two-year period, and yet the inspection standard is to be developed within a one-year time frame. The standard will be carried out by an, an improperly trained workforce. The provisions for a lead inspection standard are very detailed, very costly, and very inflexible. We do not understand the necessity of having to wait for Health and Human Services to request a request for modification within an 18-month period. This is not an efficient process. The NAA supports voluntary disclosure of any known environmental hazard. However, based on each property's operation and local regulations, the owner or manager must make a decision about disclosure. Too often, disclosure causes widespread fear and litigation problems. The presence of educated consum consumers, increasing environmental due diligence, legislative and regulatory activity of states, and desired re uh, renovation serve to address the lead issue in a far more orderly way. <coughs> We seek clarification when the bill requires a lead hazard inspection. Does the bill intend to refer to the leasing of an entire building, or must an inspection be done each time a unit is rented? In 1991, the national average resident turnover rate was 64.2 percent. Each apartment vacated generally has to comply with state or local requirements for cleaning and repainting before the next occupant. Direct exposure to LBP is reduced by the new intact paint covering. We also do not believe that HHS has the administrative experience to effectively design a disclosure statement to serve the real estate community. The EPA is far better qualified to ad address the disclosure statement. To require such detailed inspection standards and detailed disclosure statements for every sale or leasing activity would cause numerous unsafe LBP removals. Without a qualified trained workforce, without adequate proof, that intact LBP is the major source of childhood poisoning without research detailing the source and toxicity of LBP dust, without consideration of other lead sources impacting children's health, the bill would create a tremendous economic burden upon the housing community and it would still not address lead contamination from other sources. To alleviate the housing crisis and the tremendous economic burdens, NAA recommends voluntary disclosure that would include one, known information, two, specific disclosure for, for transaction needs, and three, use of past disclosure statements. The importance of public education programs cannot be stressed enough. However, we believe that HHS should not be solely responsible for this effort. The main thrust of preventative care should be handled by other agencies with more housing experience. NAA members are not adverse to addressing environmental hazards. A major concern with addressing environmental hazards is the lack of agreement as to what is a true threat to the public and where the true source originates. There is, a, there is consensus that LBP is not the major culprit of lead poisoning. Further research needs to be done on the associations of dust, soil, and paint. We ask the subcommittee consider, 
the subcommittee to consider the affordable housing crisis and weigh the economic con consequences just as importantly as the questions of health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. Dr. Jackson? There's Thank a you button very much. on the base of the microphone. Just push that button up. I should say now, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and other members of the uh, subcommittee. Uh, I am Dr. Rudolph Jackson, and by the way, that's spelled R U D O L P H. And I'm accompanied by uh, Mr. Don Ryan, who's the executive director of the Alliance to End Childhood Lead Poisoning. I'm professor of pediatrics at the uh, Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. And uh, just for a second, and only a second, the Morehouse School of Medicine is one of the most recently established uh, medical schools in this country. And it has a primary mission of training uh, physicians to care for underserved, whether they be in the urban, in town, suburban, rural, or wherever, in any locale they may be found. I've served on several faculties uh, over the past several years. Uh, one of those was the Howard University School of Medicine here in, in uh, Washington, where I served uh, while there uh, on the District of Columbia's lead committee, and this was in the late 1970s. I've also served as chairman of the Department of Pediatrics at the Mahara Medical College in Nashville, and uh, most recently and presently at the Morehouse School of Medicine, where for a period of time I served as the acting chairman, some six years, unbelievably. Uh, and I'm now, uh, as a part of my uh, duties, serving as a consultant to the Georgia State Task Force on Lead Poisoning in Children. So you can see I personally have a tremendous interest in the childhood lead poisoning problem in many ways, as well as obviously including uh, a member of the board of directors of the Alliance to End Childhood Lead Poisoning. Uh, it's my pleasure to appear before your committee today on behalf of our uh, organization, which is a new national nonprofit public interest organization on which I serve as, as I've indicated, a member of the board of directors. I am extraordinarily happy to express and to give to you the Alliance's unqualified and most en uh, enthusiastic endorsement of the Lead Contamination Control Act of 1991. I believe this piece of legislation marks a critical turning point in the battle against childhood lead poisoning. Mr. Waxman, who has stepped out, uh, Mr. Sikorsky, who is in this place now, I want to thank both Dr. Wa Mr. Waxman as well, Dr. Waxman, Mr. Waxman as well as others uh, for your personally uh, pursuing this whole problem and for your steadfast leadership in the past in reducing lead exposures from gasoline as well as industrial emissions. And you deserve a special praise for your leadership, your tenacity, and I must say certainly your endurance in the still continuing struggle to establish protective standards for lead in drinking water. Environmental health experts tell us that we know more about lead than any other environmental toxin. Over three million children, as has been said several times, are being adversely affected by lead today according to both the EPA and HHS. And as such, low-level lead poisoning amounts to an epidemic. And according to CDC and EPA, and I quote, uh, the lead problem is the number one environmental health hazard to American children today. H.R. 2840 is a landmark piece of legislation, significant in many aspects and respects. First and foremost is the fact that this bill tackles head-on, I believe, the hazards of lead paint poisoning in millions of American homes. There is consensus amongst HHS, EPA, and HUD that lead paint and dust account for the most intensive exposures and are the overwhelming causes of lead poisoning in children. Now, according to the Department of uh, HUD, over half of the U.S. housing stock, over half U.S. housing stock contains some lead-based paint. 
Some 3.8 million homes are further deemed by HUD to be priority hazards, posing immediate dangers to the young children now living in them. The, li the Alliance commends your bill's requirement for widespread inspection of housing to identify lead-based paint hazards. In the past five years, the Congress has made it, what I would like to say, the right to know as a fundamental premise of environmental health. The right to know. This principle is just as relevant to lead paint hazards endangering children in their indoor environments as it is to industrial air emissions. Department of Housing and Urban, Urban uh, Development has been widely criticized, and with good cause, I believe, for it lacks, uh, and it lacked, uh, has lacked uh, action on lead-based paint. But I want to remind uh, this committee that HUD is not a regulatory agency. HUD is a program agency, a subsidy provider with absolutely no reach over the vast majority of the U.S. housing stock. EPA is the federal agency, in my mind, with primary responsibilities for seeing that the public is protected from environmental health hazards. Yet to this very day, and I softened my statement here till I found that the EPA people were not here this morning, uh, we have concerns as to EPA's claims that its role is Dr. only that Dr. of technical Jackson. assistance. Yes. Uh, he, he may have stepped out to do a, an interview, but I, I, um, I'm I, forcing the five-minute rule. All, everything, all, your entire statement will be made part of the record. Thank you. And if we can go, and I want to thank you and all members of the panel for your assistance uh, and your t testimony. Do you want to make a Mr. Chairman, uh, in order to me to summarize, Good. This, uh, give a summary statement. Sure, I'm easy. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that the CDC is going to come out with a statement uh, that every child, or that there should be universal screening. And that means that every child should be screened. Not a poor child, not a black child, but all children. Not an inner city child. All children should be screened and that there should be funds to do this, and I believe that the CDC has been working on this. But this is going to give us a great deal more information, which will allow us to get at where the sources are and put our emphasis where it ought to be. I think that uh, perhaps uh, in closing, I would say this. The Alliance wishes to commend this committee and to each one of you for your leadership in the long battle to end childhood lead poisoning. And I would say, finally, we wholeheartedly support H.R. 2840 and urge its early consideration by the Energy and Commerce Committee and subsequently passage by the full House. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Jackson. Thank all of you. Your constructive suggestions will be reviewed by the subcommittee. The lead paint provisions of 2840 have three major components. First, a program for inspecting uh, schools and daycare centers, a program for licensing lead inspectors and abatement workers, and finally, a program for inspecting and disclosing lead paint hazards before sale or rental real estate. Can we ask, uh, we'll go through each of these. Uh, first, is there general consensus that regarding schools and daycare centers uh, that uh, the members of the panel support the provisions of 2840? Dr. Jackson? Yes. You're nodding. Most Mr. Definitely. Gorman? Yes. Mr. Jones, do you have any objection on the uh, uh, schools and daycare centers being inspected? I'm not opposed to the inspections. I'm concerned about the you know, what happens realist. after you inspect. Okay. And this is schools and daycare centers? And I'm not an expert on okay. schools and daycare centers. Ms. Stern, that's yes. your area. That's your yes. baby. You want that. National Education Association thinks it is essential that we inspect and 
take action for abatement where there are problems in schools and daycare centers. Second on the, uh, on the licensing of lead inspectors and lead abatement workers, is there general consensus? Ms. Stern, you have the microphone. That's a good idea. Yes, sir. We believe in licensing and expertise in all areas of endeavor. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Jones, uh, you're nodding your head yes. Mr. Gorman, you Accreditation agree? of training providers and licensing. Sorry. Yeah. Accreditation of training providers, licensing of inspectors and deletters is essential. Okay, Ms. Dr. Jackson. Agreed. You agree as well. The, the inspection disclosure requirements for homes and apartments, uh, you like that, Dr. Jackson? Yes, I do. Mr. Gorman? Critical. You, you, your, your people this is a big deal for it's, you. It's, 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 it's critical. I mean, there's nothing else that will drive the, the necessary work. Ms. Ms. Stearns, you, you think this is important too? Yes. Yeah. Now, Mr. Jones, this is your concern, so why don't, uh, why don't you state your concern here? I, I believe in my oral testimony I said that we were not uh, opposed to disclosure, but I think uh, our concern is you know, what's the environment in which we do that disclosure. Okay. Um, the, uh, I'm not opposed to uh, telling, you know, the people who live in my apartments uh, uh, what sort of environment they live in. But I'm not sure that this bill uh, explains to me or the people in my industry exactly uh, what will happen uh, after we do that. It's Let's see if we can work that, that stuff out. And, uh, 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 before before we leave and try to work that out and go on the next panel and, and uh, work on the bill, the National Realtors Association is, has indicated that they support disclosure of known lead uh, paint hazards. Uh, you support this, do you not? Do I support the NAR position? Yeah, that I'm not sure what their position the, is. The, well, do you support that no one lead hazard should be disclosed by a lesser, by a landlord. I believe I said that I'm not opposed to disclosure, dot, dot, dot. However, I'm very concerned about what environment we disclose in. I mean, it's just like your, your no, water you, test well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm bothered now by, the, but certainly if you have a known hazard in an apartment, you have to disclose that under common law and under usually uh, uh, right. statute. Well, we're talking about testing for lead based No, 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 paint. don't get, I don't want to get that far. Oh. I'm just trying, to, what I'm trying to do is plumb the, uh, the differences here and figure out. Uh, you're, you're saying if I knew that I had a hazard in my apartment, should I tell the tenant? You have to tell the tenant. Yes. I, I'm asking if that's the question. Yes. I would yeah. say yes. Yeah. And, and that's what the, the, in our, the National Realtors Association is, is, says as well. If, if you know of a, a lead hazard, you ha lead paint hazard, you have to disclose it to the tenant or to the buyer. And you don't, have, you, you, you don't have any problems with that. What about disclosure of potential lead hazards? From what I've read in the HUD study on lead-based paint, uh, my feeling is that there's not a clear distinction between uh, lead-based paint and the avenues into the bloodstream. Uh, if I have uh, non-deteriorating lead-based paint in an apartment, uh, I'm not convinced uh, that that is a hazard. And, I'm, and I believe that that's exactly what the HUD report says. So if I disclose that there is uh, non-deteriorating lead-based paint in my apartment, um, uh, I don't want that to be misunderstood as the announcement of a, a blatant hazard. But well, now uh, let me let me f follow this up. You uh, you support the uh, you're not convinced that lead-based paint is a hazard. I'm saying that from what I've read in the HUD report that there is not a clear distinction between uh, lead-based paint, which is not deteriorating, which exists uh, in a dwelling, uh, and the presence of lead in the bloodstream. What about deteriorating lead-based paint? 
Uh, but I would agree that that is a hazard if it is ingested. So you would support disclosure to incoming families that there is deteriorating lead well, in, paint in, and that there's a hazard if in, ingested? In, in my state, any type of deteriorating paint uh, is uh, a violation of the statewide building maintenance code. And you know, whether it contains lead or not, uh, landlords in my state uh, where localities have adopted that code uh, would re be required to remove uh, the, the peeling paint. See, I don't, I don't think there's much difference from where you are and, and where we are or want to be. Uh, uh, be yeah. Because yeah. if there's a known problem, it has to be disclosed. Right. If there's a, uh, uh, a risk, uh, uh, it should be disclosed. And the inspection component, which I understand you have some concerns with, but that, that's the thing that eliminates the hysteria, the unnecessary mm -hmm. and the alarm and the rest yeah. of it, and allows your people, as well as tenants, to focus on the problems as opposed to a, a conceptual uh, or potential problem, and allows your, your resources to be triggered in the appropriate direction. I would like to see, I would like to be sure that the people who receive the test information are as well educated and versed in the hazards of lead-based paint as, as I've become in the last week. Um, yeah. And I, I, I represent a landlord who thought that, you know, you chewed on the crib and you ate the paint, that was bad. Uh, and, and I've become an instant expert in, yeah. in paint. But Even this I morning, would, sitting through this, right. you've picked up a lot of mm -hmm. additional, uh, as we do each time we have a hearing. Let me end on the point you, you raised in your, in, you were concerned about liability if you have a yes, test sir. and you find out and who gets it and the rest of it. I'm not going to give you any legal advice, uh, uh, any free legal advice uh, or any <laughs> other kind. Uh, um, uh, but I, I, my understanding of liability uh, in, entails uh, much uh, more dramatically if, uh, uh, if you fail to do an inspection and, and incur, incur a risk. It seems to me that this approach of inspection and disclosure were appropriate uh, in a reasonable system set out minimizes liability. Failure to go that path with these kinds of things and this kind of thing in the Newsweek article and Primetime Live and that actually raise the, the uh, liability pretty dramatically and spreads it so broadly because you're not focusing things down. I, I, I would agree. Okay. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from uh, North Carolina, Mr. McMillan. I think uh, a lot of us, including some members of Congress, have become much more aware of the problem in the last week with the discovery of lead in the pipes, water pipes of uh, these buildings. Be careful. Um, let me uh, direct a, a few questions. Uh, Mr. Jones, um, have, you, have you, you or your association any notion of, of, of the cost it would take to uh, meet the provisions of H.R. 2840 insofar as rental apartments are concerned in the United States? Has anyone attempted to estimate that? Well, I think we have a lot of questions. Uh, for example, it's not clear if you have a 100-unit apartment building exactly what the testing requirements would be. Would you take 10 samples uh, in each apartment, or would you take uh, 10 samples in, in three to five out of 100? Um, I believe the HUD report says that, that a sample would cost uh, $50, uh, uh, and that in a in single family home testing uh, you're looking at maybe three three hundred and fifty dollars so it, it's it's not clear to us exactly what the specific testing requirements would be and we would certainly you know uh, uh, want to see very clear guidelines for each type of uh, uh, housing situation well I, th I think um with the addressing of the problem, should all it should be accompanied by a serious addressing of what it's going to cost, both in the public and the private sector, and a realistic uh, means of achieving, uh, of, of funding that effort. Isn't that? Uh, wouldn't that be your? Well, every practical judgment. 
every dollar that you know anyone who owns a home or an apartment uh, spends is is obviously important. And if you're going to be spending three hundred dollars a unit or three hundred times a hundred, uh, it certainly has a major impact on your business. And if uh, I were expected to get into that type of testing, I would uh, uh, I would need the resources to do it, most certainly. And, and presumably to the extent that that's not borne by government and is borne by um, the owners of rental property, then uh, ultimately that's going to have to get passed on to the renters of rental property, is it not? If you're in a market where you can do that, you pass it on. If you're not, you, you, you cut somewhere else. Um, what do you mean by, by that? You mean from a competitive standpoint or from a rent control uh, standpoint? Uh, or deferred maintenance. Either uh, one. Uh, you uh, advertise less. You uh, spend less. You look, for, you look in your budget and say, well, if I've got to spend this money, uh, where, where do we go, uh, where we can make cuts? Same, same thing with you uh, and your budget. You make do with what you've got. <laughs> Not very well. <laughs> Um, well, I'm sure that you know they're going to be rather significant costs in here for um, the federal government and the state governments as well. But I'm, I would expect that uh, the greater impact of this is going to fall upon the owners of the property. Well, I think is uh, whether that's an individual or or a rental property. I think the impact is going to be right on the owner, as as Mr. Waxman has reported. Uh, the minute he got the test, he's written a letter to the architect. When my tenants get the test, I will get the letter. Uh, and I will be asked, what am I going to do? The, uh, this may not be exactly in your field, but I think the Environmental Defense Fund has estimated that, uh, that uh, perhaps as many as 3.8 million homes might be classified as priority hazards and has estimated that as much as $240 billion would be required to rid them of, uh, of lead. Do you have any opinion about that or perspective on that? Just that it seems to be a staggering number of units. Uh, uh, that, that would surprise you that, that, that there'd be that many units? I, I, I really don't have a, an opinion on that. I don't have a very precise estimate as to what they use to back up that estimate in terms of what, what the nature of the, uh, of the hazard was, but um, that's at least one estimate, and if anyone else has any other estimates, I think it's important that we uh, try to understand them. Um, in, in your judgment, do, do you think that uh, whatever inspection and abatement uh, program um, is undertaken, that they should be addressed in some manner by state and federal tax laws in, in terms of funding the abatement of the problem? Well, I'd certainly like to see that, that somebody uh, help fund it. Uh, I know in, in my operations uh, uh, <clears throat> it would put a severe limitation on our ability to continue to provide uh, or struggle to provide affordable housing. Um, uh, our industry is under uh, severe pressure now, uh, and I think that's resulted in an enormous impact on the SNL industry, the banking industry. Uh, uh, we really can't absorb much, many more hits. Uh, so I would certainly uh, uh, need help from states or the federal government. Well, the essential philosophy followed in the Clean Air Act and in other pieces of environmental legislation is to basically set the standards and, in effect, the, the cost of the solution gets built into the cost of the product or service that's being provided. Well, that's what's happened with asbestos. Uh, the standard is there, the, the known hazard is there, uh, and the cost is, is borne by the owners. Are there some things in terms of the way that we approach the asbestos problem that would be instructive in the, term, the way that we approach this? I don't mean the nature of the problem, but how we deal with it. The, the issue of uh, 
of not creating a bigger problem in some respects, which we may have done. And then the whole issue of uh, liability that I think um, needs to be um, a part of, uh, of both. Do you, do you have a perspective on that? Have you had to deal with the asbestos problem? Yes, and, sir. Uh, most definitely. Are there some things that we could have done in, in, in that approach that may be instructive here? Well, I think right now that the, the uh, uh, Health Effects Institute is, is just in the process of coming out with some uh, new information about the, the uh, effects of the low-level exposure to asbestos and that uh, it appears that we may have uh, greatly overreacted to the, those low-level uh, exposure effects. Um, I think right now you can't undo uh, what we did with asbestos. Uh, if I tell a tenant that I've got asbestos in the building, uh, it happened to a friend of mine last year. Um, a, a, pi a leaky pipe was discovered, maintenance man went in, uh, uh, fixed it by removing the, the wrap around the pipe, uh, and he paid $6,000 to buy uh, all of the belongings, all the sheets, all the bedding, TV set, uh, everything, and move the tenant. Uh, that was uh, one hour of uh, exposure to uh, some friable asbestos. And uh, uh, I think that's, you know, uh, strictly because uh, we've, we've turned uh, asbestos into an enormous uh, uh, litigation nightmare. Uh, and, and that's what I like to avoid with the uh, lead-based paint. Did you want to respond to that, Mr. Gibbs? I did, uh, uh, Congressman uh, McMillan. I, two things that I'd like to say about it. Uh, this bill does some of the things that the AHERA legislation did not do. Uh, you have taken into account some of the, mis the uh, failings uh, in that earlier legislation by allowing or requiring uh, the secretary or whatever administrator becomes the administrator for these provisions uh, to come up with a report on abatement practices on the necessary equipment uh, and so on uh, to be made to Congress within a year after enactment of the legislation. I think that's a very responsible way to go about it, and it was not uh, present uh, in the HERA legislation. I'd also like to, to respond to uh, I, some earlier suggestions that this industry is not capable of responding to the, uh, the, the needs uh, that lead inspections uh, and lead abatement will bring. In fact, those same dire prognoses, I think, were made with asbestos and they were found uh, not to uh, have been borne out over time. And moreover, the industry and the infrastructure that it already exists on asbestos is certainly ready, willing, and able to come to uh, grips with the lead problem. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Um, Dr. Jackson, you're the medical expert on this panel. I think that asbestos legislation was important legislation, but can you give us some comparison of the asbestos problem to the lead problem in terms of public health? Yes. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Waxman, uh, we'll very quickly say that uh, time goes a little bit slower in Atlanta than it does here in Washington. And my five minutes went very, very rapidly. Uh, <laughs> And there's some things that I didn't say, and it comes along, it goes along with what has been said about uh, the asbestos problem and uh, the lead problem and trying to relate the two. I would like to say that uh, in the uh, lead problem, we see most of our problems, particularly neurotoxic problems, or central nervous system problems, or brain problems, or problems or functions as a result of damage occurring uh, in that period of time while the brain is uh, developing most rapidly. And that's in the first four to six years of life. And whatever we do, I think that uh, we need to be certain that, and this may get away a little bit from the asbestos because it causes a different kind of problem, but we need to, as a first priority, get into those daycare centers get into those schools because that's where we are going to have our neurotoxic problems and it is quite different from the asbestos problem which might affect any or different ages. In terms, One, of, the, in terms of the magnitude of the problem, do you have any sense of the I can't give you the magnitude of the problem can't. because I don't know the asbestos problem to the degree as uh, in the case of the lead problem. 
Mr. Gorman? Uh, I can respond uh, with respect to the impact of, of, of asbestos on our members and, and to some extent to lead. I think in terms of the adult population, asbestos was a bigger issue, is a bigger issue. Uh, we know that 10,000 construction workers a year are dying from their previous exposures to asbestos. But we know that with respect to our members' families, that lead is, is probably a bigger problem. Um, and uh, for that reason, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what gain there is in saying which is the bigger, but I think they're both absolutely huge. Yeah. The, um, the dollar figures that Mr. McMillan cited and attributed to the Environmental Defense Fund was greeted by nods of the head and the negative by the people here from the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, I, I, they're, they're <laughs> but uh, at, at any rate, I think it's, we ought to have more information as to what the cost estimates might be and perhaps we can hold the record open and see if the Environmental Defense Fund has an estimate. I think HUD has an estimate that uh, maybe is the one you cited. But if we talk about costs for what we're requiring to be done to deal with lead, we could also talk about the cost to our society for the children that are going to be brain damaged because of lead exposure. And I think that the uh, cost-benefit analysis of that expenditure of money to deal with lead problem is going to clearly show that uh, we come out way ahead in, in terms of societal uh, society's uh, interests. In raising it was not to suggest that we shy away from dealing with the problem, but was to have a realistic estimate of what it would take to solve the problem. No, I certainly understand. And I think we have to look at those costs. The Centers for Disease Control, I'm informed, has estimated about $50 billion to clean up and about $100 billion in benefits if, if we could just put numbers on what it would mean for a child who's uh, brain poisoned because of lead exposure. But these are important considerations. Ms. Stern? Yes, we we have a number here from Dr. John Rosen, Chairman of the Advisory Committee, uh, who's working on the uh, CDC and, and EPA cost-benefit analyses. And, and we have an estimated that says an annualized benefit of at least $4.2 billion in terms of the medical and societal savings from, from abating these hazards to children. I am struck, for example, by the similarity in the numbers that we hear here, that in an inner city area, for example, that 55 percent of the students may in fact be adversely, strongly affected uh, by lead. And then I know that in our inner city in Maryland, in Baltimore, 48 percent of the ninth graders do not make it through 12th grade to graduate. I'm struck by the fact that we have a statistic that says 17 percent of children may be adversely affected by lead in their intellectual development, and that the percentage of 16 to 24-year-olds in this country who are neither in school nor have graduated is 14 percent. These numbers are eerily close together. And uh, you know, I know as a teacher that there really is nothing that we can do to reverse these effects and that the cost of special education is, can be two, three, five, eight times uh, in, in trying to compensate for Well, it's for not just special education. Difficulty. Uh, to try to re remedy the problem, but if we're talking about school dropouts and people who are going to be uh, on welfare and on Medicaid and in prison and on and on and on, um, not that this is the only reason for all of those things, but it's something that uh, our societies can't continue to just uh, hope will get better by itself. Look, we have clearly problems to work out to be fair and how we deal with uh, letting consumers know, requiring the cleanup of uh, the lead problem, and these are details that are quite significant. They are going to require costs. We need to work very carefully together to fashion what is a responsible approach, and I'm going to certainly look forward to working with my colleagues to accomplish that result. I, the, the, each of you has given us a very helpful testimony. I appreciate your being here. We, we have one more panel, uh, but we're going to recess now until uh, 
145, and then we'll meet in this room again to complete the testimony. Meeting of the subcommittee will come back to order. I'd like to now call forward Eric D. Olson, Council Environmental Quality Division, National Wildlife Federation, Dr. L. D. McMullen, General Manager, Des Moines Water Works, on behalf of the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, William F. Parrish, Jr., Program Administrator, Water Supply Program, Maryland Department of the Environment, on behalf of the Association of State Wa Drinking Water, Jeffrey Wenberg, Mayor Rutland, Vermont, on behalf of the National League of Cities, and uh, Terry Gloriad, Chairman, Water Technology Committee, National, National Association of Water Companies. We're uh, pleased to welcome you to our hearing today. Your prepared statements will be part of the record in full. We'd like to ask if you would to limit the oral presentation to no more than five minutes. Mr. Olson, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Eric Olson with the National Wildlife Federation. I'm representing NWF as well as the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Friends of the Earth who in total comprise over five and a half million people concerned about the nation's lead poisoning problem. We support H.R. 2840. It goes beyond the empty strategies that we've seen floating around without any results. We support screening provisions and indeed believe that universal screening is ultimately going to be necessary. But most importantly, we support a renewed war on lead poisoning to end the national disgrace that has befallen the United States. It, the bill would attack lead paint and dust as well as lead in drinking water. We also support the bill that um, you, Congressman Waxman and Mr. Cardin and others have proposed, H.R. 2922, which would create a lead trust fund to deal with um, lead abatement indoors. We'll focus our primary attention on lead and drinking water and I wanted to call to the committee's attention a recent report that came out of EPA that has not received much publicity. It came out after the hearing of last uh, April that you held. Among other findings in this report, which is the final regulatory impact analysis for the lead rules, are the, some of the following staggering statistics. For example, over 23 million children in the United States, according to this document, have decreased IQ from drinking water. 23 million children with decreased IQ from drinking water. Most of these kids have decreases of less than one point according to this report. However, a full 17,000 or more lost a full IQ point or more. And indeed, hundreds if not thousands lost over five IQ points as a result of drinking water contamination. In addition, EPA estimated that over 685,000 cases of hypertension occur in men without considering women's impacts. Over 850 heart attacks, including 650 fatal heart attacks, were caused from lead in drinking water. And over 650 strokes occur annually. These are all per year. What this tells us is that the costs of inaction are staggering and that the benefits of acting swiftly are enormous. Today, about 20% of our national lead exposure on average is from drinking water, but soon it will be approximately 50% according to EPA's st studies. We agree that generally acute poisoning is caused by lead paint and other sources, but there are cases of acute poisoning from drinking water, especially with infants. Unfortunately, the EPA rules that have been issued on lead in drinking water, as the chairman has recognized, are not cause for celebration. While we see practically SWAT teams invading the vice president's house, we will see significant delays before the rest of the American public will be protected from lead in drinking water under the current rules. A review of the provisions of H.R. 2840 suggests that we will see significant improvement in this. It will, the bill would eliminate EPA's action level of 15 parts per billion that only applies to a portion of the public and will instead substitute a standard of 10 parts per billion with 100 percent applicability. We strongly support this measure. We also support, a, however, a slight change in the bill that would 
establish a 10 part per billion standard at the tap that for which there was no defense except for that a corrosion control plan was in place and complied with and a lead service line program was in place and complied with that that standard would be immediately enforceable within two to three years which would have the effect of encouraging both states and the utilities to move quickly in putting corrosion control and lead service line programs into place. We also support the expedition of the corrosion control and lead service line replacement provi provisions uh, in the bill. In addition, we would urge the committee to consider adding a provision here which would encourage water systems to voluntarily pay for lead plumbing removal in people's houses and then to bill people on their water bill. This was discussed briefly this morning, but we feel that putting something in the bill that would encourage it, not necessarily require it, but encourage it would take a step towards helping homeowners that want to do something about lead in their homes to remove it and affordably um, pay for it on their water bill. The bill also toughens the lead pipe fittings and solder requirements. We support toughening these, but we believe that there should be essentially a presumption that there will be no lead in any um, fittings or solder until um, it's proven that the lead is necessary and that it will not cause a violation. In conclusion, we commend Mr. Sikorsky, you and Chairman Waxman on your leadership on this issue and on attempting to end the national disgrace of lead poisoning. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Uh, Dr. McMullen. General Manager, Des Moines Water Works, on behalf of the Association of Metropolitan uh, Water Agencies. Welcome, and, and you have five minutes to do with what you want. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, I am L.D. McMullen. Uh, I'm General Manager of the Des Moines Water Works in Des Moines, Iowa. I'm also Chairman of the Legislative Committee of the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, or a shortcut is AMWA and which is made up of basically uh, publicly owned water utilities around the nation. I'm here to speak basically on behalf of that association. I'm pleased this afternoon to be able to share with you five views that the association has on the Lead Contamination Control Bill, H.R. 2840. But first, I'm pleased that H.R. 2840 recognizes the problems of placing a maximum contaminant level at the customer's tap for lead and instead uses a tap water lead limit. We also support within the bill the control of lead in source water, the diagnostic first draw testing, a treatment technique for corrosion control, and a public education program. The first view that I'd like to share this afternoon uh, deals with the tap water lead limit. The bill requires action, if any, sample under worst case situation exceeds the tap water lead limit. This one sample trigger does not take into account allowances for sampling air, use of illegal solder, leaching of brass faucets and fixtures, improper grounding of electrical or telephone circuits, which can by themselves cause lead levels in excess of 10 parts per billion. It would seem to be in the best interest of the public to use resources for the protection of public health to determine the cause and correct that than to jump to a conclusion with one trigger sample. The second point deals with the time frames allowed in the bill that are extremely tight for large water systems. Six months for sampling, 12 months for corrosion control studies, 16 months for states to determine optimum corrosion control, and 14 months for utilities to install and operate optimum corrosion control. If EPA or the states are slow in response, the utility is held responsible. We would rather see a daisy chain approach with each accountable for their own parts contained in the bill. The third point has to do with the lead service line replacement. The time schedule allowed for replacement also needs to be given a severe consideration. AMWA has consistently recommended that states in conjunction with local water supplies designate an enforceable schedule for each system based on size of the system, 
number of lead services, location of the lines, complexity of replacement, magnitude of lead level exceedance measurements. All reviewed and approved by EPA. We appreciate within the bill, though, the recognition of the problem of large systems by granting them additional time for replacement. Four, control versus ownership. The water supply community has always defined the term control to mean ownership. This bill defines control differently and places significant additional financial and legal responsibilities on the water supplies. And finally, the fifth issue, uh, dealing with the Safe Drinking Water Act reauthorization items. The bill requires all existing rules using PQL to set MCLs. The significance of this provision cannot be overstated. Its ramifications are far-reaching and deserve careful consideration during reauthorization of the Safe Drinking Water Act. We also feel the issues of classes of public water systems, action levels, citizen suits are more appropriate with reauthorization of the Safe Drinking Water Act than the Lead Contamination Control Bill. I would like to thank the subcommittee uh, for working with us on this very important issue and welcome the opportunity to continue to work with the subcommittee on this and other Safe Drinking Water Act issues. This concludes my remarks. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, um, Mr. McMullen. Mr. Parrish. Good afternoon. My name is William Parrish. I'm the administrator of the drinking water program for the State of Maryland Department of uh, Environment. And I'm here representing the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators, ASDWA, which is a professional association which represents the interests of state drinking water programs, whose primary mission is the protection of public health through effective management of state drinking water supply programs and implementation of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, 56 states and territories are members or participants in ASDWA and its activities. And these administrators are supportive of the need to reduce lead exposure through paint, dust, food, and drinking water, particularly for susceptible populations such as small children. They are supportive of requirements that suppliers of water to communities, schools, daycare centers, and businesses provide to the best of their ability water that is non-corrosive to distribution and plumbing materials, and that portions of the distribution system under their control do not create hazards with respect to lead in water. While the intent of the Lead Contamination Control Act of 1988 was to address some of these concerns, the lack of funding for state program implementation of the act and for school testing and remediation have significantly hampered the efforts of states and schools to comply with the provisions. Nevertheless, many states and schools should be commended for the work that they have completed. While some states may be able to implement the suggested provisions in the 88 Act with adequate funding, there is serious concern about the state's abilities to implement H.R. 2840, which expands the Act to include national primary drinking water regulations for lead. In fact, if passed as drafted, this Act will spell the end of state primacy under the Safe Drinking Water Act. It would also fail to address the contribution of individual home and building plumbing systems to the problem of lead in drinking water. The state concerns are basically with the burden of implementation and resource constraints on their programs. States are particularly concerned that the Act extends coverage from approximately 80,000 community and non-transient systems to over 200,000 public water systems. There is no evidence presented to date to suggest that short-term exposure to lead levels found in drinking water from transient non-community systems presents a significant health risk that would warrant states and water systems expending such enormous amounts for testing and remediation by extending the regulation to cover the additional 120,000 systems. One state estimates costs for monitoring alone of its 6,500 transient systems will be $20 million. The Act also drastically shortens the compliance period to require all systems to begin implementing tap sampling within six months of enactment and eliminates the state's ability to manage the significant workload generated under this act based on the availability of state resources to conduct the work. The requirement will, will also stipulate that state and EPA agencies cannot regulate any class of public water supplies in a manner that may be less protective of public health than is required for all other 
systems. This will dra dramatically alter the manner in which EPA promulgates stand, uh, regulations by requiring all systems to comply with the same requirements regardless of size and degree of health risk posed by the use of water by the public. Uh, under the amendments, the states are also required to make uh, various and numerous technical determinations which uh, must be offered for public notice and comment. Uh, we estimate that uh, this would implementation would require up to a million opportunities for public hearing and comments uh, under the Act. In addition, states must submit to the administrator of EPA on a quarterly basis extensive reporting of all of its activities and decisions made, which has a drastic impact on state uh, resources and capabilities, which are already limited under the existing regulations and future to be adopted over the next few years. Also, there, there's concern that the uh, setting of the TWLL at, at 10 parts per billion will effectively mandate corrosion control for all but a few systems. With respect to resource constraints, 33 states are already currently experiencing serious budget deficits, according to a recent study by the National Governors Association. The aggregate shortfall is about $9.6 billion, or 3.6 percent of total spending. This fiscal dilemma has resulted in significant difficulties for environmental and public health programs, of which drinking water is a part. Across this country, drinking water administrators and staff are being furloughed, personnel are taking pay cuts, and agencies are implementing hiring freezes. This comes at a critical time when most states have recognized that sufficient funding for the Safe Drinking Water Act will not be forthcoming from the federal government, and state legislators are reluctant to fund any more federal mandates with limited state dollars. Furthermore, many water systems may not be able to support fee-based systems due to excessive monitoring and compliance costs, which are required to achieve compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, regulations. According to a resource needs st study conducted by EPA and ASDWA in 1988, states estimated that an additional $47 million will be required to implement the EPA lead and copper rule. Enactment of the LCCA require amendments will require far greater expenditures on the order of an additional $117 million. Mr. Parris, the rest of that statement is going to be in the record. Pardon? The rest of your statement will be in the record that you're reading to us. Uh, Mr. Uh, Wenberg, I'd like to hear from you next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'm Jeff Wenberg, Mayor of Rutland, Vermont, and a member of the National League of Cities Energy, Environment, and Natural Resources Steering Committee. I'm here today to testify on behalf of the NLC and the 15,000 member cities and towns across the nation who we represent. The National League of Cities recognizes the importance of taking concrete steps to significantly reduce, if not virtually eliminate, human exposure to lead. Municipalities are in a unique position to implement comprehensive public education information campaigns with relative ease. We can hold public meetings, help disseminate information through the local media, target mailings, contact individual residents, and warn of potential dangers from lead in drinking water. We can adopt policies and enact ordinances to require that potential home buyers are informed about lead hazards associated with a particular residence. A public information campaign should dovetail with a comprehensive effort to test lead levels in drinking water supplies. As a municipality develops a record of patterns of lead contamination within the water system, it can target warnings and assist property owners in identifying lead reduction strategies. We acknowledge that many water systems need to diminish the corrosivity of their water. As mayor of a city that has already implemented corrosion control, I am particularly encouraged by the use of this strategy because I know that lead levels are being reduced throughout our city's water system, even in places that we have not identified as posing a threat to public health. Although lead service lines need to be replaced in many water systems, I believe that we need to give corrosion control techniques the time to work before undertaking an effort as disruptive and costly as the removal of lead service lines can prove to be. Based on my understanding and given my city's experience with con corrosion control, I think some modifications should be made to H.R. 2840 to help ensure that municipal water suppliers have sufficient time and also sufficient information to undertake corrosion control uh, successfully. Water system operators indicate that they need a minimum of one full year to conduct a corrosion control study 
a time frame inadequately provided for in H.R. 2840. Similarly, many water systems will need more than one year to fully implement a corrosion control program. Because water chemistry changes with seasons, fluctuations in rainfall, air temperature, and other climactic variations, optimal corrosion control will need to be revised on a regular and ongoing basis. The overall goal needs to be to keep improving the quality and safety of our water, which is a like, likely to require two years rather than the one year called for in the legislation. We must also look carefully at the implica impl <laughs> implications of requiring implementation of corrosion control in small systems that are already strapped for research resources and often lack the necessary technical expertise. Small water systems need assistance, planning for the required studies and with the implementation itself. Failing to acknowledge this need will simply mean that lead levels in these communities will not be lowered. Although we recognize and support the removal of lead service lines known to contribute significantly to water lead levels, the cost of this undertaking warrants a careful look at timely and effective alternatives that can achieve a comparable reduction in lead levels. Water suppliers should make every effort <clears throat> to inform residents of the contribution that lead lines they own are adding to the contamination of their own water. On the other hand, it is inappropriate for a municipality to go into a private home to make changes on the property itself. One final point I would like to make about the requirements to ensure that lead levels in drinking water in every home should fall below the 10 parts per billion tap water lead limit. We believe it is preferable to establish a requirement to be attained by 90% of the high-risk homes, as is required in the regulations promulgated by EPA. We do not propose to ignore the remaining homes that may exceed the lead limit. Rather, I suggest that the legislation permit the use of other approaches that would work to reduce lead exposure in those homes, but wouldn't involve system-wide solutions. It must be recognized that any time you introduce any chemicals into the drinking water supply, you run the risk of lessening its quality. This can result from inappropriate application of the chemical or from the interplay of that chemical with others previously applied or naturally uh, contained within the supply. The chemistry of water is a tricky science with many factors impacting its characteristics. I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I wish I am pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Weinberg. Mr. Glorion? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Terry Glorio. I am Vice President of Production for St. Louis County Water Company and am Chairman of the Water Technology Committee of the National Association of Water Companies. The NAWC represents the nation's privately and investor-owned water utilities. We have 320 members in 39 states providing drinking water to 22 million Americans every day. Mr. Chairman, I strongly applaud your tireless efforts to reduce the threat of lead contamination in this country. The NAWC stands ready to work with you to further reduce the threat of lead poisoning through the nation's water supply. But as currently written, the NAWC cannot support Section 3 of H.R. 2840, the Lead Contamination Control Act amendments. H.R. 2840 parallels the 1991 EPA lead rule in many respects. The key difference between the EPA's rule and the Lead Contamination Control Act amendments from a technical standpoint is the parameter used to judge optimization of corrosion control. The former judges optimization at the point where 90% or more of worst case first draw samples have a lead concentration of less than 15 parts per billion. <clears throat> the Lead Contamination Control Act amendments judges optimization when no first draw lead sample exceeds 10 parts per billion. My foremost concern is over this tap water lead level of 10 parts per billion. This is a standard that cannot be met even <clears throat> by our member companies already performing corrosion control. It is also very unlikely our member companies with no lead service lines could meet this standard. My company recently performed voluntary sampling at a school district in St. Louis County. We tested 476 drinking water samples from faucets and drinking fountains. 
Only three first draw samples exceeded the action level of 15 parts per billion, while 11 exceeded the tap water lead level of 10 parts per billion. None of the 22 individual schools are served by lead service lines, and the water supply has been subjected to corrosion control treatment, including lime softening, which forms a protective film on the interior surface of the pipe materials. The difference between the 15 parts per billion action level and 10 part per billion tap water lead level is not an issue of stringency in public exposure levels. The question is which parameter best serves as a measure of optimization of corrosion control. There is a risk in establishing an impossible to meet measure of corrosion control treatment. It may discourage such treatment that might otherwise be installed were a realistic measure used. A 10 parts per billion tap water lead level will not distinguish between those systems that have optimized corrosion control and those that have not. Other provisions of the legislation also cause concern. Section 1418B reduces the time allowed for corrosion control from six to three years. In addition, systems have, with few exceptions, only five years to replace all of their lead service lines. These time frames are unworkable. I would recommend instead that each water system develop the shortest timetable feasible subject to approval by the primacy agency. Section 1418E, subsections D and E require water systems to replace the entire lead service line if under the system's control. Control, however, is defined much more broadly than ownership and will make systems responsible for the replacement of lines they do not own. Mr. Chairman, the public education notices found in the bill are alarming and sensational. This language ought to be modified so it is informative, not inflammatory, or it should be completely removed and allowed to be determined in the regulatory process. Finally, Section 1418E, subsection I, encourages our members to enter the banking field. The responsibility to fund plumbing removal lies squarely with the homeowner, not the water supplier. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the health effects of lead are a serious matter that must be addressed. The EPA rule, although not perfect, was a reasonable compromise for achieving reduced lead levels in drinking water. In comparison, H.R. 2840, as currently crafted, is not workable. We encourage the Congress to allow the EPA's lead rule time to produce results. Further steps to reduce lead exposure through drinking water must be judged in light of the experience and information gained through this process. I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify before you today and would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Glorio, gentlemen, for your testimony. I, um, I must say that I'm more than a little disappointed with the tenor of the comments of the water supply industry and the state authorities sharing responsibility for drinking water protection. While I understand the fiscal constraints and the plea for greater federal monies, a matter which I believe Congress must be responsive to, I'm at a loss to understand the general opposition to taking steps that are clearly needed for protection of the public health. To hear your testimony, one would not think, and drink, think the drinking water contamination with lead is a particularly serious problem in this country. But the facts reveal a very serious problem. EPA studies conclude that 240,000 children each year are having their IQs lowered as a result of lead contamination. Doctors have informed the subcommittee that babies are being lead poisoned as a result of contaminated water in their infant formula. In the past month, the lead problem was the subject of the cover story for Newsweek, which I'll hold up for you in case you haven't seen it, and more recently, drinking water contamination is treated in the cover story for U.S. News and World Report. But somehow, the importance of this problem seems not to have taken hold among the water supply industry. In this legislation, we've taken steps to address the concerns for the industry uh, as it was previously voiced to us. We have, we have eliminated the MCL for lead at the tap. We have made clear that in no case will water suppliers be held accountable for lead contamination beyond their control, asking only that each system do all that it can to reduce lead exposure. We have provided a lengthy extension of the lead service line replacement schedule to accommodate the concerns of cities with large numbers of service lines. Now, when the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies testified on lead three months ago, 
The witness, Mr. Wickshire of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, described elements he thought were important in a legislative effort to deal with this issue. He expressed for, uh, support for an MCL in the system, like the one included for source water in H.R. 840. He expressed support for service line replacement as rapidly as possible, and we provided for that in H.R. 2840. He expressed the concern that water suppliers should not be held responsible for sources of lead beyond their control. And this bill is very clear. Once a system has done all that it can, service line replacement, corrosion control, public education, it should be required to do no more. But it should be required to do at least that. And Mr. Wickshire expressed concern with an MCL at the tap. He said, and I quote, the problem is the MCL standard at the tap continues to convey the impression to the public that the water supplier will take care of them, end quote. He didn't want the public to get the impression that because there was an MCL, all was within the water system's control. And a major departure from our past position in deference to this concern, we eliminated the MCL at the tap, replaced it with a new term, the tap water lead limit, which does not carry the baggage that the MCL phrase carries. And Mr. McMullen, can you please identify for me any areas where we did not respond to the AMWA's concern as outlined by Mr. Wickshire? Well, to the best of my uh, information, I feel that you probably have. Uh, the things that we have identified today primarily are dealing with the timelines uh, on the um, implementation schedule and in particular the one sample trigger uh, on the uh, tap water lead level. Uh, that one sample trigger is, a, is something that's new, at least uh, in, in my information and knowledge, uh, that was not available to uh, my colleague from uh, Los Angeles at that time. Well, are those the two issues then, the timeline and the, um, what was that last one? The Timeline, and a single, uh, um, the, the um, single sample trigger. Single if we, sam if we sample dealt with those trigger. two issues, would we have uh, uh, we, met the uh, requirements that the AMWA has suggested would be important for legislation? Well, we also have the, um, the other issue uh, of the PQL. Well, wait a second. You Oops. just said you had two issues. Well, so now you have a third issue. I apologize. Issue. Uh, See, the point that I'm trying to make to you is that we had your witness from your association here. He spelled out the things he wanted. We met each one of those points, as you admitted today. Now you mentioned there are two and three. And it seems to me there's a growing list of, uh, of demands that keep on coming up ad hoc. Uh, these additional problems seem to convey the message that what you really want is for Congress to do nothing about lead contamination. Instead, you favor the EPA regs that will not provide protection for 20 years and even then will still leave 10 percent of the population wholly unprotected. Well, I think in my testimony I've said that we are very supportive of a lot of the features that are contained in the bill. We listed five issues today that were new to us that we're just responding to, to the legislation that you drafted. We're trying to come up with something that we feel is in the best interests of not only the utilities but the public, provides uh, good quality water, protects it on lead, but yet doesn't provide an overburden uh, on neither the public or the utility industry. Okay. Well, we'll continue to try to work with you on this, but let me go on some specific issues. Mr. Glorio, in your testimony, you express a preference for the EPA regulation over the approach of this bill. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, EPA's regulations has a 15-year time frame for service line replacements in any water system, regardless of how many or how few service lines the system has. Does it make good sense to you that every system in the nation should take as much time as a city like Chicago, which has more than 450,000 lead service lines? Does it make sense that it should be 20 years before children over the whole country are protected from lead contamination just because of the problems in Chicago? I, I think case-by-case case determinations in every city are going to argue for different time frames. Um, well, the EPA approach gives the same time frame for 15 years 
I think it would needlessly condemn millions of children to unnecessary lead exposure. What we've tried to do in our bill is provide for service line replacement as quickly as possible. And that will uh, be different from different uh, areas. That means granting an extended time frame only for municipalities with very large numbers of service lines. Others would have to replace the service lines much more quickly. What's wrong with that? Our, the central focus of our objection uh, really is the single sample trigger that will <clears throat> perhaps instigate service line replacement when, uh, when other ways could be used to reduce lead contamination. Your testimony is that you prefer the EPA regulations that allow 15 years for everybody. But you've, as I heard what you had to say a minute ago, you don't think 15 years is really necessary for many of the water systems in this country I, to I replace think, their service lines. Okay, I think I have to look at both of them together. The issue of lead service line replacement has to be looked at in the time frame allowed and also what's going to trigger that lead service line replacement. I think under a, a single sample uh, 10 part per billion trigger, more and more and more um, lead service lines will be uh, called for replacement than perhaps the number of lead service lines under the EPA rule. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I, I think that... So you the, think it would call for more service lines to be replaced? I do. But isn't, isn't that uh, service lines that are contributing to the problem of lead contamination? <clears throat> uh, and from the data that I've seen, you know, and from some of the data even that, that was uh, given by a witness earlier this morning, it, it's clear that much of the lead problem is at faucets and fixtures and, and is not a part of the service line Well, material. we're not talking about uh, faucets and fixtures. We're talking about service lines. And the, and the provision says a system is not required to replace an individual lead service line if the state determines after notice and opportunity for comment that the service line does not contribute, the service line does not contribute to the water lead concentrations in excess of 10 parts per billion. In such a case, the service line shall be treated by the system as a non-lead line. So we're not talking about in, in the homes, we're talking about the service lines. Shouldn't they be replaced? Not if they're not contributing to the problem. The provision says they're contributing to the problem. If they're not contributing to the problem, we don't disagree. If they are contributing, then yes. Do you agree? If they are contributing to the problem, they should be replaced? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Yes, Mr. Scorsese, you? certainly. You can't object to the bill that does what you, what you want to be done. Now, I know there's a, there's a, uh, there's a whole bunch of old opposition to doing something here. And, and if you got problems with the mechanics or problems with the concept, substantive problems with the policy, bring them out. But this idea that you're against 2840 because it'll unfairly and wrongly and stupidly pull up service lines that don't contribute to the lead problem is, is not accurate. The bill states specifically, service lines not contributing to violation shall be treated by the system as a non-lead line and not have to be pulled. We're all in agreement. That's what the bill says. So don't, again, lodge against this legislation an argument that is, is, doesn't apply to this legislation. It just seems to me Thank that you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, you gentlemen would prefer the EPA regulations. I understand why you might prefer it, uh, because it gives you so much time and it's so much looser. But I don't think that regulation makes sense. We're trying to fashion something that's going to protect the public, especially children, from lead contamination much earlier. So help us draft a bill that you can live with and work with and it makes sense, because you can't say it's this or that. Uh, if you're going to give us requirements that you want changed, if we're going to, if we're going to change them, then we want you to uh, understand that they're changed and not to come up with more, uh, more uh, objections just to uh, uh, stall the process. Mr. Parrish, uh, I want to direct, uh, direct this to you. I was very surprised by your opposition to requirement that states must implement the Safe Drinking Water Act as a condition of primacy. This is the way the act is supposed to work. So I understand that's the way all these environmental laws work, that uh, it, the states are given the authority to enforce the laws, and if they're not doing it, then the federal government will come in and take away the, their primary responsibility. 
Can you provide an example of any other environmental law where states are allowed to be delegated primacy authority without implementing the law? No, I'm not. The, the uh, position of ASDWA is that specifically uh, stating in this, this proposed legislation that EPA shall withdraw primacy specifically for lack of full and complete implementation of this act. What's wrong with that? Well, there's nothing wrong with that if, if you can accept the fact that if, if that's the requirement that the states will have to give up primacy. And no, no, will be no states except the fact that the states are supposed to enforce the law. Can you accept that fact? It sounds to me like you're saying because the states don't enforce the law, they still shouldn't lose primacy. But if you're not enforcing the law, why should we let the states uh, act uh, as the primary ones responsible when the law says they have to do it in compliance with the uh, federal requirements? The uh, situation is, is with the, the current regulations, uh, the states are required to have the authority to implement the regulations. Um, there are extension uh, opportunities given to the states, and they are allowed the, um, the time to develop the resources necessary to implement the rules. The way this act is, is uh, written, uh, the states will immediately have to begin uh, putting all of their resources into implementation of this act alone, and will not be able to implement any of the other requirements of this under the Safe Drinking Water Act and public health protection across the country provided by state drinking water programs will come to a halt. Well, wait a second. Are you telling me the states aren't supposed to enforce all the drinking water law? The states are responsible for... They're, they're doing the, the whole, best... The whole act itself, the Safe Drinking Water Act, and you're supposed to be in charge of me meeting all the requirements of the law. And if you're not in charge of and, uh, doing that, then the states lose the authority to, to conduct the program. Get, why don't the states, why are you telling me the states can't enforce the law? Given the, the resources provided by the federal government and the state governments, the drinking water agencies are doing the best job that they can. Well, let me ask you about the best job they can because this article in the, uh, in the cover story of U.S. News and World Report quotes uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Elder the EPA's new drinking water chief, and he says 48 to 49 states are failing to adequately enforce existing regulations. Does that sound like that's the best the states can do when 48 or 49, as I last recall, there are only 50 states aren't even living up to the requirements of the law? This doesn't sound like a very satisfactory uh, way to conduct your responsibilities. Is that acceptable? Given the resources that the states have to use from federal and state sources, they are doing the best job that they can. Uh, passage of this act would, would absolutely sink all the state programs. Well, I think then if the re resources, uh, resource constraints are the problem, we ought to talk about what we can do to help on resources. But it seems to me that the Safe Drinking Water Act is not just something that's uh, a bureauc bureaucratic responsibility that's unimportant. It's a legal requirement set in place to protect the drinking water consumers in your state. And during my time here in Washington, D.C., I am to live in your state of Maryland. And I hate to think that I come to work and drink drinking water that's filled with lead and then go home in Maryland and find out that uh, I, the drinking water supplies may not be uh, meeting all the requirements of the federal law either. The problem I see is really one of missed priorities. Clearly we must make drinking water protection a higher priority if the public health is be to be protected. If this means that some states are going to lose primacy, as far as I'm concerned, so be it, as unfortunate as that might be. Mr. Olson, do you want to comment on this? I would like to comment just briefly. Um, as you may know, EPA's rules had always said that EPA shall withdraw a state's primacy if the state was not complying with all the requirements in the act. 
And uh, we threatened to sue EPA because of the situation you described, because so many states were not complying with the act. EPA's response to that threat was not to improve the compliance of the states, but was rather, without notice and comment, to simply issue a rule that says, well, shall now means may. We now have the discretion not to withdraw a state's primacy, even if the state is blatantly, uh, illegally um, implementing the act. We challenged that in court, and um, EPA, the day of the oral argument, um, we said that it was going to revisit this um, since it hadn't gone through notice and comment. They now have um, issued exactly the same rule. Um, so right now, under EPA's rule, which is still subject to challenge in court, um, EPA could simply ignore um, illegalities in the state, no matter how gross they are. Well, that's a fine commentary uh, to the American people about uh, how their drinking water is being protected. Mr. Sikorsky. Thank you. On that, Mr. Paris, the quotation is from EPA's drink, new drinking water chief, 48 to 49 states are failing to adequately enforce existing laws. And yet, in statements that are made by the people who are responsible to enforce the laws and people delivering the water in public whenever a reporter or someone raises the question with the data, with the testing results, there are always these very genuous, gener generous comments about the health and the safety of the water. Um, tell me if the EPA drinking water person is saying 48 to 49 states aren't enforcing adequately the, the law, and we are aware of EPA's reluctance to push, if they're really admitting this, how everyone keeps, why everyone keeps making these generous statements about the safety of the, of the law and telling people, don't worry, be happy. Again, all I can, can tell you is that the states are doing the best job that they can in prioritizing their activities. That. Then I think every state health or water drinking water expert and all the local drinking water experts should, should put a little condition or caveat on their statement to the public trying to reassure them that everything is fine by saying to the, under the resources that we have, and in violation of the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act and all the rest of it, we're doing the, we're, we think the water is as safe as, uh, as we can get it at this point. That's the honest statement. And, I, and, and it'll be refreshing to hear it instead of the statement made to, to members of Congress and the public when they ask legitimate questions about safe water are told everything's fine. Mr. McMullen, you also expressed support for the uh, EPA rule. And uh, th this gets to the issue we talked about on, on hazardous lines, this EPA rule that 90 percent uh, is okay. And the fairness of the new line now we're hearing is why should one bad house cause us to rip out a line, a, a leaded line? Uh, one aspect of the rule that I find especially problematic concerns the details of the lead service line replacement program, the focus of the, or the target of attacks. Under the regulation, if a water supplier tests a service line and finds that the lead concentration within the line is less than 15 parts per billion, that is, say, 13 parts per billion, the line not, need not be replaced. Even worse, the water system gets to count that line as a line that's been replaced under its 7% per year requirement for service line replacement. Explain to me the logic and the reasonability of that. I don't remember that I made the statement that I was supportive of the EPA rule. Uh, I think I identified uh, there was a couple of spots within the uh, proposed legislation that I had a problem with, in particular the one uh, sample trigger. In any analytical work that we do uh, in, in the laboratory of a water utility, if we end up with one sample that is bad, 
that usually requires us to resample and try to find out what really is causing the problem. And I'm not here to basically say, I'm not an, a health expert to basically say that 10, 15, 13 um, micrograms per liter is a safe level. I think that's the health effects people that really need to make that type of a decision. So you're not, you're not in support of the EPA rule? I'm, I'm here today to basically comment on the legislation that you have. I, I'm supportive of a lot of the features that are contained in it. It parallels the EPA rule in a lot of places. There was five positions that I felt could be refined to make it even better. Okay. And that's my comment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gloria, you're in favor of the EPA rule. I'm in favor of the EPA's rule as it compares to your bill in Section 3. Oh, you don't like the EPA rule either. That's an unfair I, I think we indicated in our testimony the EPA rule is not a perfect rule. We have a lot of problems with the okay. EPA rule. But because it's too strong or not strong enough? It's, it's confusing. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell me, do you support the 7% seven, uh, seven per year requirement? I, I don't know that I support that or not. Do you support being able to count dirty lines that are less than 15 parts per billion as, as uh, lines that have been cleaned up just the, because they've been tested and found less than 15 parts per billion? It, the objective of the rule is to replace lines that are contributing, and if lines are shown not to be contributing, then why, why replace them? They are contributing. They're just not contributing to over 15 parts per billion. And, it, and if 15 is the trigger in the rule, yeah. then and it, you 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 change the you change the discussion again. And that's how absurd this provision is. I'm not saying they shouldn't be counted as. I'm not saying they should be replaced if they don't count. If they don't, I'm saying should they be counted as being replaced if they're not replaced? Why not? I mean, you. Oh, why not? Because they're not being replaced. Then it's a definitional problem. Yeah, but it, it, yeah, it's a definitional problem to you, but for me and for the American people, it, re, it, it, it means leaving hazardous lines in place longer. Not only the one that's been tested and comes in a little under the magic EPA 15 parts per billion, but another line that does come over the 15 parts per billion doesn't get pulled because this tested but un, unreplaced line gets treated as a replacement line. That's why not. Gentlemen, you me? Sure. Well, the, to put this thing in perspective, the rule as I read it says that if a, if, it's, uh, if a line is under 15 parts per billion, let's say it's 13 parts per billion, the line doesn't have to be replaced. All right, so it doesn't have to be replaced. So you don't replace it, but then you count it as if it were a line that was replaced. And if you count it as a line that's replaced and you say that there's only... Uh, 7%. 7% per year that you have to replace, then you could count those lines you didn't replace as lines you replaced. And then when you get to the point of lines that must be replaced, it could be uh, many years down the road. For example, a city where 70% of the service lines are 15 parts per billion could escape having to deal with the 30% that caused the biggest problem for 10 years. That doesn't make sense to me. Does that make sense to you, Mr. Gloria? The, the, the only sense, I mean, if I look for some rationale in that, the, the, the only rationale I can come up with is that th the rule is aimed at primarily eliminating problems that are due to lead service lines and, and doing that over some scheduled basis, a, a percent basis. Um, whether the lead line is eliminated because it's replaced or because it's measured and found to be okay is counted the same way. I, I, didn't write, I didn't write the EPA rule. I mean, I'm guessing at what the rationale is in that well, rule. I, if you look at it from a public exposure standpoint. You, you, you're supporting that rule. and That's why we're picking on you on that rule. You didn't draft the rule, but you're supporting it. And I don't think it's supportable. Because if you have 30% of a city's water supply that's very dangerous, you should replace it. Not say you don't have to get to it because the other 70% the is not so bad yet, and you can count that in this crazy definition as replaced because it's not so bad that it needs to be replaced. That, I mean, that's, that just defies logic, defies 
the understanding of the English language, and it defies any sense of trying to protect the public from the 30% that should be replaced up front right away, not later on, in order to uh, make sure that we get the reductions in, uh, that in, in the exposure to people. I understand your objection, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Sikorsky? Well, uh, I'm maybe late. Uh, uh, let me just leave a, with a comment. Uh, in the ANWA testimony, the members provide safe, high-quality drinking water directly to over 75 million people and directly to an even greater percentage of the population through wholesale supply. And in uh, your testimony, uh, uh, Mr. Gloriad, you say our member companies provide, proudly provide safe, reliable drinking water to 22 million Americans every day. Under the Safe uh, Drinking Water Act, uh, you're required to test for lead, right? Both of you are nodding yes. And when you find lead, you're, you're required by law to notify the public of that. Yes. Right. And the testimony of the EPA was that, or is it the uh, G GAO study was uh, showed that, what? Inspector, was it the Inspector General's report or the re study done uh, is that like 90% of the of uh, your departments, your little your local age your groups that are providing this water, are in violation. They don't notify the public of the of the lead lead problems. You still feel good about proudly providing? Well, the the, uh, the AMO members uh, are providing basically under the current MCL rules uh, that are available. And that's the, what we're after. And the work that we've done at the Des Moines Water Works shows that the majority of the lead is being picked up in the homes within the plumbing fixtures and in the piping within the home, which is beyond uh, our control. And under the current rule, our sampling point is within the distribution system of the water that we're supplying. Well, I, I think that, you know, there's going to be a truth in labeling squad and it's going to hit your people hard unless you get on the right side of cleaning this up. Uh, uh, you, I, your job is tough. Your re resources are limited. You're trying to uh, count for bugs and make sure a whole bunch of things don't get into the water side besides smell and taste and, and cater to every, every uh, uh, taste that's out there. Uh, you, got a, you got a tough job. But this lead is an important health risk, and it's a health threat that you're going to have to respond to. And you can either be behind prime time or under the 60-minute telescoping camera lens uh, on the front cover of one of the news magazines, or you can try to keep up with, the, with them. Because I'll assure you, in apples and cake mixes and everything else, when the public gets nervous, really nervous. They come down hard and their regulation, not EPA's, not ours, their regulation is pretty crude. And uh, your people will pay uh, f uh, for failure to respond to this problem. And, and I hope you, you can uh, work with us and not against us in formulating something that we can all live with. Mr. Sikorsky, yes. if I might, I think the NAWC has long supported the goal of monitoring even even beyond those things that were regulated in the Safe Drinking Water Act to know as much as is, as is able to be known about the quality of the water supply and in farming our customers through voluntary mailing of brochures and I think our position is exactly the same on lead. Um, I subscribe to the right to know comments of this morning's testimony that we need to know the quality of our waters, we need to monitor it and our customers need to know. Thank you. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Korski. Mr. Olson, uh, I, I'm just astonished at this uh, authority that's been provided for this re calling something replaced when it hasn't been replaced. Do you want to comment on that? Well, it just defies um, explanation from our standpoint. Um, there's no reason to treat something that hasn't been replaced as replaced. I mean, it, it speaks for itself. Well, the uh, SDWA certainly has a basic approach and philosophy that uh, all water consumers are to be protected 
Mr. Olson, what's your view of the provision leaving 10% of the population unprotected? Well, we're very concerned about that. That was one of the primary reasons that um, the Natural Resources Defense Council, which I'm shortly to move to, um, has challenged the um, lead rule um, that up to 10% of the tested taps will simply be exempted from the um, requirements of the Act. Um, we're concerned that what that will mean is that the, 10 per, the worst 10% of the homes in uh, many communities may not be protected whatsoever in perpetuity under the rule. And there's simply no uh, justification for that. Um, I, I'd like to respond to this sort of the argument that one bad apple don't spoil the whole bunch. Um, the notion that only one house being tested would trigger all these requirements. Um, well, the only thing that will be, there is not going to be any requirement to replace all the lead service lines in the entire community if just one house has a problem. You only have to replace the lead service lines under the provision that you just read if the lead service line is contributing to a violation. So you don't have to pull up all the lead service lines just because one house is bad. Um, so I think that's a red herring of an argument. Well, before we conclude, anybody else want to add uh, something to the discussion? Mr. Wenberg? I'd just like to uh, make sure there's no misunderstanding that the position of the National League of Cities is not in any way, shape, or form in opposition to this legislation. And in many respects, this legislation is substantially better than the EPA rule. And uh, the fact of the matter is 100% of United States citizens live at the local level. And local officials are absolutely no less concerned. I, speaking for myself, I have a two-year-old daughter and another child on the way in November. Um, I suspect that I could present that as evidence of perhaps being at least as much concerned, at least as concerned as, as the people here on your committee and, uh, and the various people responsible for um, sharing a responsibility for protecting the public health and safety. We stand ready and look to you for leadership to work with you to make these new levels um, a reality for, yes, 100 percent of American citizens. What we look for is leadership and flexibility, just a little flexibility and recognition of the fact that not all our communities are the same, the problems won't be the same everywhere, and there will be opportunities for solutions which will differ from one community to another. If we can work with you to incorporate that flexibility, I think you will have resulted in uh, crafting a piece of legislation that will go a great distance to uh, protecting the health of the people of this nation. I thank you very much for those comments. I think that's a good way to end the hearing on an upbeat note. And let me just say to all of you, it's our purpose, and I think we share the same purpose of trying to protect the uh, health of the American people in a fashion that's reasonable. We will continue to try to try to, even though it gets discouraging maybe for all of us, both of us, uh, to work out uh, the provisions of this legislation. Thank you for being here. That uh, completes our hearing today, and we stand adjourned. Here is a programming note to be with us Friday and Sunday evenings here on C-SPAN for Road to the White House. We travel with candidates and potential candidates as they move closer to the 1992 presidential election. Highlights include stump speeches, journalist roundtables, and discussions with political analysts as they size up the 1992 race. That's Road to the White House, Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, and then again Sunday evenings at 9.30 Eastern Time, only on C-SPAN.